Please copy and distribute this book or video freely. Thank you. Ezekiel's Atomic Wheels and Four Beast Forces. Extraterrestrial Craft in Merkaba. The book of the prophet Ezekiel is the 26th book found in the Old Testament of the Standard Christian Bible. The book chronicles six visions of the prophet during his 22 years of exile in Babylon. The first vision, often referred to as Ezekiel's Wheels, is the vision we will be focusing on in this presentation. There is much speculation as to what exactly these wheels represent. Some suggest that these wheels are part of a flaming chariot that houses the throne of God, while others claim the vision describes an extraterrestrial encounter. Some believe the wheels describe a personal teleportation device called a Merkaba, while others believe these wheels are simply too great of a mystery for any mere mortal human to comprehend. There is yet another interpretation that the researchers and scholars seem to have missed. An interpretation that, in some ways, combines all the other interpretations into a sort of grand unified theory, or standard model if you will. In fact, that is exactly what the world of science calls it. The standard model of particle physics. And, it looks as if Ezekiel was given a vision of some of its most basic of principles. Of course, one must not take man's word for it. One must let the word of God teach us whether these things be true or not. So, without further ado, we will now turn to scripture for the true meaning of the vision of Ezekiel. Amber and the Electron And I looked, and, behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof is the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4. Our very first verse in this study is quite electrifying. Several clues as to what Ezekiel's vision was about is immediately given to us. A whirlwind gives the impression of something that is constantly spinning. In the world of quantum mechanics, subatomic particles of matter also spin. A well-known subatomic particle that is famous for spinning and whirling is called the electron. As electrons spin and whirl about a center called the nucleus, something called an atomic orbital is created. This orbital is often referred to as an electron cloud. A fire enfolding itself is a perfect description of said electrons whirling about in their orbital clouds. Isn't this incredible? The mystery of Ezekiel's wheels is finally solved. This concludes our presentation. Wait, time out. Isn't this just a weak attempt at forcing a verse to match science? This looks like wishful thinking to me. This proves nothing. Good call Mr. Referee. You are correct. We need to show much more evidence if we wish to convince the public that Ezekiel was looking at atomic construct. Let us now look at the final word in our verse, amber. What is so special about the word amber? If we look at the JPS Tanakh translation of Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4, we see the mystery of Ezekiel's wheels revealed right before our very eyes. For you see, the word amber is translated as electrum. Why? because amber is where we get our modern word for the electron. Therefore, amber and electron are synonymous. In other words, according to the Bible, Ezekiel was shown a vision of electrons. Literally. But it does not end there. We are just beginning to gather the supporting evidence to prove that the most intimate details of atomic construct were written about thousands of years before their discovery. The Four Beast Forces also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5. As we move along in the book of Ezekiel, we find a reference to angelic beings known as the four living creatures. Later verses would go on to describe them as cherubim. The four living creatures present us with yet another great mystery as to what their ultimate meaning and purpose is. Fortunately, God has provided us with many clues scattered throughout the Bible to help us out. Once we put these clues together, we will be able to solve this riddle once and for all. We will begin with their faces to see what God has to say about them. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion, on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 10. Each living creature has four faces. A man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. As with previous studies, we will let the word of God teach us what these faces represent, beginning with the man. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green weeds that were never dried, then shall I be weak, and be as another man. 
Judges chapter 16 verse 7. Throughout the Bible, man is often described as being weak. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. Mark chapter 14 verse 38. Again, we have another witness to the fact that man is a weak force and in need of salvation. Let us now look at the word, lion. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Daniel chapter 6 verse 27. Lions are described as being powerful. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is also the light of the world. Light is electromagnetism and the photon. What else does a lion do in scripture? Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces, while there is none to deliver. Psalms 7-2. Lions can tear things into pieces, and the lion of the tribe of Judah is no different. What does the Lord rule with? And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Revelation chapter 2 verse 27. Jesus rules with a rod of iron and dashes his enemies to pieces like a lion tearing his prey. Thus, the rod of iron is also representative of power, as well as the force of electromagnetism, having the ability to disintegrate matter. Think of how a lightning strike can dash a tree into pieces. Let us now focus on the ox. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 4. The ox is described as a strong force in the Bible. How about another witness? That our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in, nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Psalms 144-14. Again, the ox is described as a strong force. What about the eagle? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 4. What goes up, must come down. Of all the faces that each living creature has, none can defy gravity as the eagle does. And what a perfect example of Newton's law we have in this verse. Indeed, the concept of gravity is best represented by the eagle. Gravity is also said to be fast or swift. The eagle is swift. Now, to those that study physics, these four forces should sound familiar. That is because the four faces of the four living creatures ultimately represent the four forces of nature. Note that the word, power, in the Bible, is the same as our modern word, electromagnetism. Thus, man represents the weak force. The lion represents power, or electromagnetism. The ox represents the strong force, and the eagle represents gravity. Remember, this is the word of God teaching us this, not man's overactive imagination. To deny these truths, is to deny the verses we just went over together. Please note that the graviton, shown in some of the images in the presentation, is still hypothetical. Like peering into a microscope, as the vision draws closer and closer to Ezekiel, more and more elements begin to come into focus. We are beginning to see a picture developing. A picture of the world of quantum mechanics appearing right before our very eyes. The more we progress through the verses of the vision, the more we increase the zoom level, or magnification of the microscope. Eyes of Glory As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 13. The whirlwind is now close enough for Ezekiel to be able to describe its appearance in more detail. Several important clues are given. Coal is a form of carbon. We may be getting our first hint at just what specific chemical elements Ezekiel was being shown. Carbon has six neutrons, six protons, and six electrons. In other words, six, six, six. Could this be related to the mark of the beast? We will explore that question later in this study. Before the invention of the light bulb, lamps, usually fueled by oil, were a source of light. And as we have already learned, light is a form of electromagnetism. What else is light? For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. 
Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23. Light obeys the laws of physics in our universe. Light is also the word of God. What else can we learn about light in the Bible as it pertains to Ezekiel's vision? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Matthew chapter 6 verse 22. This verse is a perfect example of how the Bible is its own dictionary and its own thesaurus. God is teaching us that the word, light, and the word, I, have the same meaning. If we add up the evidence thus far, we find that the lamps Ezekiel saw were most likely eyes. Could these eyes represent electrons? We know that these lamps went up and down among the living creatures. The phrase, up and down, is a bit vague as there are many ways this can be translated. Let us see if we can find something similar in scripture. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10. Here we see that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. The phrase, to and fro, is like the phrase, up and down, that we find in Ezekiel's vision, and with regards to the eyes of the four living creatures. The general meaning here is that the eyes seem to follow a specific path that has a type of reciprocating or oscillating motion to them. We call these oscillating electrons frequency. Frequencies create the electromagnetic spectrum. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord, to provoke the eyes of his glory. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 8. In this amazing verse, we see a link between the electron eyes and the glory of the Lord, or as the world of science calls it, the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible part of the spectrum would be the rainbow, which is another word the Bible uses to denote the glory of the Lord. Our final clue as to what the vision of Ezekiel was all about can be found in the word lightning. This should be obvious to anyone who understands what lightning is. Lightning is electricity. If there is any doubt as to what Ezekiel was looking at, this should make things crystal clear. The Breastplate Standard Model Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures, with his four faces. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 15 God has increased the magnification once again on Ezekiel's microscope. Next to the four living creatures, we find an object described as a wheel. Not just a single wheel however, but a wheel in the middle of a wheel. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 16. We will focus on the wheels in a moment, but first we must study the word, barrel. This seemingly insignificant little gemstone is going to lead us to one of the most extraordinary discoveries in the history of Bible research. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod thou shalt make it, of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen, shalt thou make it. Exodus chapter 28 verse 15. Part of the Old Testament's high priest garment was something called the breastplate of judgment. The breastplate contained three columns and four rows of gemstones for a total of twelve gemstones. Coincidentally, the standard model of particle physics also contains three columns and four rows. However, instead of gemstones, the standard model contains particles of matter called fermions. These twelve particles make up everything we see in the universe. They are the basic ingredients that form all matter. The electron just so happens to be one of those particles. The first row on the standard model contains the up, charm, and top particles. The second row contains the down, strange, and bottom particles. The third row contains the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino particles. And finally, the fourth row contains the electron, muon, and tau particles. We will now focus on the high priest breastplate to see what gemstones make up each row. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. Exodus chapter 28 verse 17. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. Exodus chapter 28 verse 18. And the third row a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. Exodus chapter 28 verse 19. And the fourth row a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. 
They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. Exodus chapter 28 verse 20. When we combine the standard model with the gemstones, we find that the sardius matches with the up particle, the topaz matches with the charm particle, the carbuncle matches with the top particle and so on. If one does a study on each of these particles in relation to the verses each gemstone is found in, something incredible happens. The Bible actually goes out of its way to describe the particles as well as how they function. The odds of this happening are next to impossible, which means that this information was deliberately encoded for us to find when the time was right. That time is now. In 1799 a discovery was made that would forever change how Egyptian hieroglyphs were translated. That discovery was the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone contained a single decree, written in three different languages. One of those languages was a mysterious set of pictograms called hieroglyphs. Scholars were able to compare each language in the Rosetta Stone to ultimately decipher the hieroglyphs. In a similar way, the standard model is written in the language of science while the high priest breastplate is written in the language of the Creator. The Bible acts as the Rosetta Stone that allows each language to talk to one another. Armed with this key, we can now bridge the gap between the world of science and the Word of God, something thought to be impossible until now. To illustrate this, we will choose the most recognizable particle to translate, the electron. The electron matches with the gemstone called the barrel. Using the King James Bible, the only reliable translation for this process, we will search for the word barrel. If our Rosetta Stone is accurate, we should be able to learn intimate details about how this particle behaves and what its purpose is by reading its comparative verses. Barrel Electron Orbitals His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 14. In this verse, we see that the barrel is connected with the word, rings. The barrel gemstones are bound in a type of orbital path that follow the ring's shape, just like electrons orbiting around a nucleus. These are also a picture of God's hands. This teaches us that the hand of God contains electromagnetic power. And his brightness was as the light, he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 4. Horns are another word for power in the Bible. Moses literally had rays of light and power emanating from his hands. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Daniel chapter 10 verse 6. Are you beginning to see how the Bible Rosetta Stone works? The word barrel is connected to lightning, as well as eyes and lamps of fire. All are a picture of electrons. The word of God is often redundant so that there are multiple witnesses for us to cross-examine. This brings us back to Ezekiel. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 16. After adding up all the evidence, we find that the wheel in the middle of a wheel is none other than a representation of electron orbitals. Science calls these wheels, or rings, shells. And since there are two wheels, or two shells, we can deduce that the particular atom that Ezekiel was shown had two orbital paths. There are several elements that have two shells or a wheel within a wheel. One is the carbon atom and the other is the nitrogen atom. Both are essential ingredients that make up life, and both can be found within the pages of scripture. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them for. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 18. And, just as we suspected, the eyes truly do represent electrons that follow their ring orbitals. Earlier we learned that coals are made of carbon-666. Diamonds are also carbon-666. In the third chapter of the book of Ezekiel, God places a diamond, or 666, on Ezekiel's forehead. We will get to that in a moment, but first let us now focus our attention on the nitrogen atom and why God wishes for us to learn all we can about this element. The stone with seven electrons. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9. 
Now that we know eyes represent electrons, we can begin to decipher cryptic passages such as this one. One rule the Bible Rosetta Stone seems to follow is that each particle that makes up a typical atom should be counted as the same number. In other words, a stone with seven electrons would also have seven neutrons and seven protons, respectively. This means that the stone with seven eyes represents the seventh element in the periodic garden of elements. That would be the nitrogen atom. But why nitrogen? A clue may be found in the phrase, engrave the graving thereof. For you see, nitrogen is the key ingredient that makes up DNA in all life. More specifically, nitrogen makes up the letters of DNA, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Science calls these letters, nitrogenous bases. The Lord of Hosts is proclaiming that one day, a new genetic sequence will be, engraved, upon these nitrogenous bases, which will take away the sins of mankind. But how do we know this verse is referring to DNA? Are we jumping to conclusions? We turn to the Word of God for answers. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. The stone with seven eyes is the slain lamb of God. Jesus is that stone. The reason why the lamb is slain is because this is a representation of the blood of Christ. Blood is a biblical word for DNA. Since every Christian knows that Jesus represents the Word of God, we can conclude that the blood represents the nitrogenous bases of DNA. It is also representative of Abraham's seed. Notice the word horns are there as well. Horns represent protons. As a bonus, we find that the seven eyes are not only electrons, but spirit as well. These seven spirits are sent out to all the earth. Indeed, nitrogenous bases are in all life. Nitrogen is even in the air we breathe. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, Job chapter 27 verse 3. Earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. Thus, the seven spirits of God is the nitrogen we breathe. It is in our nostrils. The Spirit of God runs to and fro throughout the earth. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word of God became DNA. The Word of God became blood. The Word of God became flesh. The Word of God became Jesus. Now do you understand the ultimate meaning of Ezekiel's vision? How about one more hint? When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 21. The seven spirits of God were in the wheels. The four living creatures represent the four nitrogenous bases that make up DNA. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. In other words, the vision that Ezekiel was given was one of the most incredible, beautiful, and profound prophecies in the history of creation. It was a vision of God manifesting in the flesh. Sign of Jonah. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. Luke chapter 11 verse 29. Now that we know that eyes are associated with electrons, we can use this powerful information to dig deeper into the sign of Jonas to see if there is something that the scholars may have missed. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Luke chapter 11 verse 30. Those who understand the basics of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, also understand that this prophecy was fulfilled long ago. The wicked generation that existed during the time of Jesus were witness to these events. However, there are those who believe that the sign of Jonah was a dual prophecy, and that something similar will happen yet again in the future. If we interpret the verses that follow this one, through the dual prophecy lens, Several incredible revelations are revealed to us. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation, and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Luke chapter 11 verse 31. All of a sudden the narrative switches to a future time called, the judgment, in other words judgment day. 
Remarkably, the verse is also teaching that the Queen of Sheba will rise up. What this implies is that we are also looking at the first resurrection when the saved awaken from their slumber. Thus, both Judgment Day and the first resurrection of the saved are happening at the same time. The phrase, this generation, would therefore mean man 1.0. In other words, this generation represents the genealogy of man that has existed since Adam and Eve. When man 2.0 arrives, the end will come as in the days of Noah. God will have no choice at that point but to exterminate the genetic abomination idols man creates. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and, behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Luke chapter 11 verse 32. The people of Nineveh were saved because they repented. They too will rise up in the first resurrection. And because they are considered righteous saints, they qualify as judges to condemn. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. Clearly the Queen of Sheba as well as the men of Nineveh will be part of the resurrected saints that judge and condemn the wicked generation. These are great revelations so far, however the final one is very profound. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore when thine eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light, but when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Luke chapter 11 verse 34. Yes indeed, you know what the eye means now. It represents the electron, the photon, the lamp of light as well as a major component of the nitrogen bases of the soul. Look at the context this verse is in. It is part of what is happening in the first resurrection. It is describing the rapture. Moreover, it is describing that the saved will have bodies of light. They are caught up into the four winds of the nitrogen atmosphere. What about the body of darkness? What bodies will the unsaved have? The opposite of the electron is the anti-electron or positron. Do the unsaved end up with a body of antimatter? Stay tuned for the answer. Top Secret As we go deeper still into Ezekiel's vision, we find ourselves on the cutting edge of mankind's understanding. If you are fortunate enough to be watching this, consider yourself to be very blessed. This is no joke, because we have cracked the Ezekiel code using our Bible Rosetta Stone, we now possess the extraordinary ability to predict the future of technology. In other words, we are about to learn things that no human being in the world has any business knowing at this point in time. Extreme caution should be used here. The revelations we are about to uncover could potentially be used to destroy the entire universe as we know it. Again, this is not a joke and not meant for drama. This is very, very real. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal, stretched forth over their heads above. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22. Above the four living creatures was a certain type of firmament which Ezekiel referred to as the terrible crystal. What exactly is this crystal firmament? And why is it so terrible? And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Revelation chapter 4 verse 6. This terrible crystal firmament is called the sea of glass in the book of Revelation. We know this because we find the same four faces as we did in the book of Ezekiel. Note that the four faces of the four living creatures are called beasts. These are not the living creatures themselves. They are the individual faces described as separate entities. In other words, the four beasts of the Revelation throne room represent the four forces of nature. So, what is the sea of glass? And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Revelation chapter 15 verse 2. The sea of glass is the dimensional barrier that separates our three-dimensional reality from higher dimensions. In other words, those above the dimensional barrier, exist in the heavenly, or spirit realm outside of our universe. Those below the dimensional barrier, exist in the earthly, or physical realm. In Hebrew cosmology, this dimensional barrier is sometimes referred to as a, glass dome. This dimensional barrier can be manipulated in such a way as to create portals anywhere in the space-time continuum. 
It is what makes interdimensional travel possible from the new heavens and new earth to our current heavens and earth. After this I looked, and, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. John was teleported from earth to heaven via this sea of glass portal. A door was opened, and John saw a new earth and a new heaven. Science calls this new heaven and new earth a parallel universe. And since the word of God is teaching us that a man can travel back and forth between said parallel universes, that would mean that, with the right technology, mankind will eventually be able to do this without God's intervention. This brings us back to the warning. For you see, the secret of traveling between parallel universes lies in a very special and very strange particle of matter. There is a reason Ezekiel used the word terrible crystal with regards to this portal to heaven. Keep watching if you dare. Strange matter doorways. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 26. The throne that the father was sitting on was made of sapphire stone. The sapphire stone is the middle gem on the second row of the high priest's breastplate. Why is this important? Because it is the sapphire stone that is the key to time travel, teleportation, and the link between heaven and earth. Anyone who can harness its power has the potential to become a god. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 14. The goal of the Antichrist is to become like God. This will be accomplished by ascending to heaven via this sapphire doorway. And now comes the dangerous part. We will use our Bible Rosetta Stone to discover the exact particle of matter that acts as the key to all of this. Are you ready? It is the strange quark. Quite the name it was given, eh? It is this particle that the Bible predicts that one day, mankind will learn to harness and control for the ultimate purpose of becoming like the Most High. There is a bit of fine print, however. Strange matter, if placed in the wrong hands, has the potential to destroy our entire universe one day. Strange matter is said to be the most dangerous substance known to exist. A quote by Edward Farhi states, A lump of strange matter has an insatiable appetite for neutrons, and grows fat by eating them. What this means in layman's terms is that, anything that comes in contact with strange matter will itself be transformed into strange matter. Imagine for example, a meteorite made of strange matter that exploded out of a neutron star long ago. If such a meteorite of strange matter were to fall onto Earth, the entire planet, and everything in it, would be transformed into a lump of strange matter. And the stone that smoked the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole Earth. Daniel chapter 2 verse 35. Could the stone cut without hands that, fills the Earth, be the sapphire strange matter throne that God sits upon? One thing is for certain. Anything this stone touches becomes filled with it. What if it filled the whole universe as well? And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4. Imagine the entire universe dissolving and rolling up like a scroll. This will happen one day according to Revelation. What could cause such a terrible thing to occur? And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Genesis chapter 11 verse 6. Like the people who tried to reach into heaven, particle physics laboratories are attempting to unlock the secrets of how God operates. CERN is the largest. The goal is to eventually breach the sea of glass barrier and peer into the heavenly realm. Sounds like they may run into a bit of a snag along the way. No wonder CERN chose Shiva as their god. Shiva is the destroyer of the universe. Perhaps this has been the goal of CERN all along. Pentaquarks with strange quarks have recently been created. The Mark of the Beast And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and, lo, a roll of a book was therein. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 9 we are now in chapter 2 of the book of Ezekiel where God is about to make Ezekiel eat a small book called a roll. One important rule that must be followed whenever interpreting verses in the Bible is to always stay in context with what has already happened. 
Let us review some of the topics we have covered so that we may apply this rule to the role Ezekiel is about to eat. Chapter 1 dealt with the word made flesh via the four nitrogenous bases of DNA. A, C, G and T. We learned about carbon being 666 and nitrogen being 777. The word made flesh is also called the mystery of godliness. There are other parts of Ezekiel's vision that describe the Godhead as well as the Trinity, Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. We will go over this soon. This is something the Trinity critics will hate to hear. And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 As we learned earlier, God manifest in the flesh was one of the greatest events in all of history. Conversely, there will be another history-making event that will occur one day in which the man of sin will manifest in the flesh. This event is called the mystery of iniquity. During this time, those that are unsaved will receive a certain mark. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, or in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 13 verse 16. One of the scariest prophecies in all of scripture is the infamous mark of the beast. Those that take it are doomed to be thrown into the lake of fire. The mark is so permanent that God is unable to offer salvation to those that receive it. It is the unpardonable sin. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Again, this is a great mystery and subject of much debate. Not to those that understand scripture of course, for all is revealed to those that study to show themselves approved unto God. Let us now study this mark with regards to Ezekiel's role and put this mystery to bed. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 3. We quickly move to chapter 3 where Ezekiel eats the roll. It is important to note here that DNA is also a book and a roll. The food that we eat contains mostly DNA. Therefore, the role Ezekiel ate was likely a picture of DNA as well, however, this particular DNA role that Ezekiel ate had the power to transform Ezekiel into something that resembled the mark of the beast. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 9. In this incredible prophecy of the future mark of the beast, Ezekiel's forehead was transformed and made into an adamant. The word adamant is another word for diamond. Diamonds are made of carbon, as in 666. What the Old Testament is teaching us here is that Ezekiel received a 666 carbon mark on his forehead. This transformation gave Ezekiel so much strength as to be practically invincible, and in a sense, immortal. In other words, it is as if God made sure that Ezekiel could not be killed. Note that this was not accomplished by receiving a microchip implant or tattoo. This was done by ingesting something that actually caused the very DNA of Ezekiel to become transformed. This is very important to remember as the mark of the beast is transhumanism. Yes, transhumanism is what God is showing us here. It is a covenant with death. All life on this planet is carbon-based. The false promise of immortality in a carbon body is what will be offered. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Revelation chapter 9 verse 6. It is clear that those with the mark of the beast are unable to be killed. They cannot even take their own lives. Something dramatic has happened to their DNA. The tables of their heart have been rewritten with a pen of iron technology and a tip of carbon 666. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart, and upon the horns of your altars. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 1. Here we have another witness to the fact that the diamond is responsible for writing sin. Where? In the table, or DNA of the heart. Both adamant and diamond share the same Hebrew word. Shamir. There is an old legend about a miraculous worm called the Shamir. According to the legend, the Shamir was used to carve names into the gemstones of the high priest breastplate as well as help build King Solomon's temple. Since we know that the temple represents the human body, this Shamir worm was most likely a vision of DNA manipulation. In a future study, we will learn that the gemstones also represent nitrogenous bases in addition to particles of matter. 
Interestingly, the Strong's number for ashes, another form of carbon, is 666. This coincidence may be another way God is trying to get our attention. The person placing the ashes on their face was attempting to alter their identity. This is precisely what the mark of the beast is all about. Changing one's very own identity. Becoming human 2.0. And carbon will play a key role. The mark in the right hand will be new fingerprints and palm prints. The mark in the forehead will be new facial recognition features such as a new eye color or hair color. These changes will be permanent. And the only way to accomplish this is through one's DNA. Once one changes their identity, they will no longer be God's property. They will become the property of the beast system. The Mark of God And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4 Jumping ahead to chapter 9 of the book of Ezekiel, we find the exact opposite of the mark of the beast. The mark of God, placed on the forehead by an angel with an inkhorn. What is interesting here is why God chose these specific people to place his mark on. He chose them because they sighed and cried over seeing all of the abominations that were taking place. What were these abominations? Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 5. In the temple of God stood an abomination called the image of jealousy. Again, the temple represents the body. This image of jealousy represents a genetic abomination that is placed inside those that receive the mark of the beast. Those that sigh and cry are a future prophecy of the saved that will refuse the mark of the beast. So I went in and saw, and behold every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall roundabout. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 10. Ezekiel yet again is witness to advanced genetic concepts as it pertains to the temple body. This time it is genetic engineering. Creeping things are a picture of DNA. Abominable beasts are the genetics these DNA fragments came from. Idols are the gods mankind wishes to become, utilizing said genetic engineering. Let us look closer at these abominations. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. The abomination of desolation placed inside the body temple is such a grievous crime that it causes the end of the world to transpire. Not before a great tribulation occurs first, however. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew chapter 24 verse 21. Genetic engineering, aka transhumanism, aka, the mark of the beast, is happening at this very moment. Hybrid humans are being created as you are reading these verses. It is only a matter of time before the world must make the decision to either sigh and cry, or join the beast system. And, behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 11. Incidentally, ink just so happens to be made out of carbon 666, just like coal and diamonds. This ink was placed on the foreheads of the saved. More evidence that the mark of the beast has to do with carbon-based life. Please note however that this mark was written, as opposed to ingested or injected. Also, let us not forget that horns represent power in the Bible. Think power of the Holy Ghost. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 2. In this truly astonishing verse, we see yet another prophecy of how carbon relates to the mark of the beast. The man with the inkhorn literally goes into the DNA of God's chariot and grabs a handful of carbon atoms. He then scatters said carbon atoms over the city in what can only be described as a picture of mass indoctrination into the 666 beast system. There is another deep meaning contained in this verse. It is very subtle, therefore, we must find a verse with a similar theme to help us see it more clearly. 
Something is being separated out of the Word made flesh. For the Word of God is quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. According to Scripture, man is a tripartite being consisting of body, soul, and spirit. All three are represented in Ezekiel's vision. In addition, this verse is teaching us that there is a real and tangible dividing line that separates each component. We are about to go over this in more detail, however there is a bit of a disclaimer to review. Johannan comma. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. Something very important everyone should be made aware of is that there is much debate as to whether this verse should be included in the Bible or not. It is argued that this verse was added later. Whether this is true or not is for you, the student, to make your own conclusion on. The bottom line is that the rest of the Bible agrees with this verse, thus it will be used in this presentation as a point of reference. One of the biggest keys to unlocking the deepest mysteries of the Bible, especially with regards to the concept of the Trinity, is to recognize that the Trinity is much easier to understand when viewed from the Father, Word, Holy Ghost perspective as opposed to the Father, Son, Holy Ghost perspective. This will become more evident as we continue. Spirit, Soul, and Body Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 20 this one is easy. The spirit was in the wheels. We already know that the electron, eyes, represent that spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. Spirit is power. Spirit is energy. Spirit is light. Spirit is electromagnetism. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court, as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 5. A major clue as to what the four living creatures represent is found in the sound that their wings make. It is the Word of God. What does Scripture teach us about the meaning of the Word of God? Now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Luke chapter 8 verse 11. This is a major piece of the Ezekiel puzzle. The wings of the cherubim represent nitrogen bases. Thus, the four living creatures represent the four nitrogenous bases that form DNA. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. This is the Word of God in all life. The wings of the cherubim are also found covering the Ark of the Covenant. The Word of God is in the wings. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14. This is a very disturbing revelation. The wings of the Ark of the Covenant not only represent nitrogen bases, they also represent the genetics of Satan. Was there someone in the Bible made in the likeness of sinful flesh? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, Romans chapter 8 verse 3. Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, Jesus was made in the likeness of you and me. Therefore, the wings of the cherubim reflect our earthly biology. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Psalms 139-16. The Word of God forms the Book of Life. We call God's Book of Life, DNA. And it is this unique DNA code that forms the soul of all life on the planet. No two DNA codes are the same. Every soul is different. Some DNA codes will be saved, while others will not. The process of how DNA creates flesh was written thousands of years before their supposed discovery. This is just one of the many miraculous revelations the world has yet to wake up to. The DNA code was made flesh and tabernacled with us. The body is what the DNA soul code creates. In the vision of Ezekiel, the body would be represented by the coal that was separated out and scattered over the city. Remember, coal is carbon 666. Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. We are all carbon 666 life forms, whether we like it or not. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. 
And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Those that do not understand that the Bible teaches that life is tripartite are missing crucial elements of what God is ultimately teaching. The spirit is the energy that quickens the soul. The soul is synonymous with the genome of DNA. When the two are put together, they form proteins, flesh and eventually the body. This brings us to the sword analogy. How is a sword related to spirit, soul and body? We turn to the book of Daniel for an important clue. I Daniel was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Daniel chapter 7 verse 15. Pay attention to the word spirit, and the phrase midst of my body. These are tripartite references. Something amazing happens when we look deeper into these Hebrew words. Pierced hath been my spirit, I, Daniel, in the midst of the sheath, and the visions of my head trouble me. Daniel chapter 7 verse 15, Young's literal translation. Immediately we see references to a sword. Daniel's spirit was pierced. Moreover, we see that Daniel's body is being symbolized by a sheath. A sheath is what a sword goes into when it is not being used. In other words, as the spirit and soul go into the body, similarly the sword goes into the sheath. Thus, the sword represents both spirit and soul combined. Note that the spirit and soul can be separated from the body at any time. This is what happens when a person passes away. Both their spirit and soul leave the body. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 22. Here we see that the soul can return to a body. The soul is information that lives on after death. Since we know that an iron rod represents electromagnetism, we can see that the sword is similar in nature. The iron represents the spirit energy that quickens the genome while the double edge represents the two strands of DNA. The word of God is alive. Each component can be separated, analyzed, quantified in a simple and easy to understand manner. Incredible. Computer analogy. If we were to use a modern illustration of body, soul, and spirit, a perfect example would be the personal computer. The case, keyboard, mouse, etc. would represent the body. It is the physical hardware. The BIOS, operating system, and other software would represent the soul. The electricity that powers the personal computer would be the spirit. Now, what would happen if, for example, the hardware was destroyed? This would be the equivalent of the body dying. If this did occur, the software would remain intact because a copy, or backup, was uploaded to the cloud. And, depending on which system one put their trust and faith in, the backup would have ended up in one of two locations. One of those locations is safe and secure with no data loss whatsoever. That would be Abraham's bosom, or paradise where the saved data waits to be resurrected into a new glorified personal computer one day. The other location is not so safe and secure. Massive data loss is a guaranteed certainty. Pain and suffering would be the outcome. That would be hell and torments. The chances of the data surviving to be re-uploaded into another personal computer are slim. Not only was the body hardware destroyed, but the soul software, and data was destroyed as well. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. Once both personal computer and software are destroyed, the only thing left is the electricity. What happens to the electricity once the computer no longer runs? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7. The electricity goes back to the power plant. In other words, the spirit returns to God. Please understand that the same spirit can power a brand new computer if God so chooses. We will cover reincarnation and how Jesus taught it in another video. Understanding the Trinity, finally. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 10, New Living Translation. This is one of many verses in the Bible that teach the concept of the Trinity in plain sight. Abraham is the archetype of the Father in heaven. The more one understands Abraham, the more one will understand God the Father.
Levi was a son that had yet to be born a few generations into the future from the lineage of Abraham. Yet here we see that Levi is inside of Abraham. How can this be? It is because Levi is in the form of the Word. The seed is the Word. This is how a son can exist inside of a father. Another way of putting it is that Levi is in Abraham's bosom, literally. He is one with the Father. The Father is in him, and he is in the Father. The next verse we will look at, will make this point even more clear. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. This verse contains a great revelation. Abraham's seed is an allegory about a single person. That person is Christ. Now, this may sound confusing until we realize that Christ represents the Word. Not just any Word. Abraham's seed is a future promise of the glorified body. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29. And there we have it. The Son is inside of the Father via the Word. The Word is quickened by the Holy Ghost. They are three, yet they are one. See how simple of a concept this is? What confuses so many is when it is assumed that the Son exists outside of the Father. How can a being who is separated from the Father be one with the Father? We will now summarize the Trinity to clear up any misunderstandings once and for all. On the left we have a representation of Father Abraham. Abraham has a body. Abraham is also flesh. Thus, Father, body and flesh are interchangeable. In the middle we have a representation of Abraham's seed within his body. Seed is also the word. Abraham has a soul. Abraham also has a genome. Thus, word, seed, soul and genome are interchangeable. On the right we have a representation of Abraham's spirit. Abraham's spirit is also the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is electromagnetism. Thus, Holy Ghost, spirit and electromagnetism are interchangeable. When all three are combined, we have the Trinity. Again, the Trinity is simply the tripartite being. It is in all life. There is no reason to make this as confusing and as complicated as is currently taught. To claim that the Trinity is some unfathomable mystery is the epitome of ignorance. Please note that the Godhead is similar, but not exactly synonymous with the Trinity. There are subtle differences that we will go over in a moment. Shemitah Nitrogen Cycle but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field, nor prune thy vineyard. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 4. A mandate in the Old Testament termed the Shemitah, called for allowing the land to rest every seventh year. No planting, pruning, plowing, or harvesting was allowed during that time. A bountiful harvest was promised to those that obeyed this law. What the ancients may not have understood, is that this resting period was essential to something called the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is the biogeochemical cycle by which nitrogen is converted into multiple chemical forms as it circulates among atmosphere, terrestrial, and marine ecosystems. The nitrogen cycle is vital for life on Earth. Through the cycle, atmospheric nitrogen is converted to a form which plants can incorporate into new proteins. Once again, we see clear evidence that the number 7 has everything to do with the chemical element nitrogen and the basic building blocks of life. Moreover, there is the concept of fertility. The land, like a mother, is ready to receive seed and bear fruit on the eighth year. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. Luke chapter 13 verse 8, New Living Translation. Nitrogen is a vitally important fertilizer. In this verse, we see it being used with regards to the fruitfulness of a fig tree. Of course, the spiritual meaning here is that both Jews and Gentiles must bear fruit, in other words, repent and produce good works. If not, the consequences is that the fig tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The fig tree in this context would represent the genome of man. Those with evil genes, who are unable to be salvaged, will be thrown into the lake of fire and their genetics erased from the book of life. Ultimately, the Bible teaches God eugenics. The politically correct term is salvation. The so-called names that are written in the Lamb's book are not Susie or Billy. The names are genetic sequences. Many are called, few are chosen. Do not despair, however. God can take those who are cast into the manure pile and give them another chance.
He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. 1 Samuel 2-8 The dunghill is the manure pile of nitrogen fertilizer where the unsaved soul nitrogen-based genomes go after they die. Yes, the nitrogen cycle can include people. Notice that the word, dust, is synonymous with fertilizer? The Bible is teaching about organic compounds. Abraham's seed will be like the dust of the earth. Do you get it? Seed? Word of God? Dust is where we return because that is where we were taken from. Are the pillars of the earth some silly Hebrew cosmology fairy tale about a flat earth? Does God set the earth on top of cement columns like the legs of a table? Or, do the pillars of the earth have something to do with RNA and DNA? Could the dunghill where the dead are buried be shoal? What does the word of God mean when it speaks of people as the pillars of the earth being raised out of the dust and the dunghill? Obviously there is a profound meaning being taught here that many, if not most, are ignorant of. Do not let the so-called scholars tell you that the Bible was written by simpletons who had no idea how the world was created or how it works. We know better. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Luke chapter 14 verse 34. Salt in the Bible is another term for fertilizer. Many times however, salt is described as an antithesis to fertilizer as we see here in this verse. Those that have become fools are said to have lost their savor. The fool is about to fall into the dunghill to become worm food. He has lost his edge. The word seasoned is associated with words. Speech must be seasoned with salt. Seasoning is of course the stimulating condiments we put on food to prepare it for consumption. In other words, they are organic compounds of DNA. It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Luke chapter 14 verse 35. If the salt is so bad that it cannot be used for fertilizer, it is cast out. The delete button is pressed and that genome is no longer available to become fruitful. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Genesis chapter 19 verse 26. Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. See how the word, pillar, fits into what we have been learning about those that are in Shoal. Some are raised out of it to become pillars of society. There is a cycle being taught here about death and rebirth. It is the nitrogen cycle of life. All the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord, have I given thee, and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, by a statute forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. Numbers chapter 18 verse 19. The covenant of salt is the promise of salvation. It is the promise to rescue everyone from the dunghill. Note the word, seed, in the verse. You know what that is now. We become Abraham's seed and are made pillars in New Jerusalem. And he dreamed, and behold a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Genesis chapter 28 verse 12. Jacob dreamed of a DNA ladder. Angels are able to ascend and descend to earth because of this special genetic code that they were created with. Thus, the glorified body will be like a Merkabah. In other words, the glorified body will be able to travel interdimensionally, without the use of man-made technology. It is Ezekiel's chariot manifesting through the portal of the firmament. It is the word made flesh. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. Genesis chapter 28 verse 18. After having the dream of how glorified DNA worked, Jacob marked the occasion by creating a pillar out of the stone. Think about the stone with seven eyes nitrogenous base we learned about. The oil signifies the Holy Ghost electromagnetism that quickens the word of God to energize it and make it come alive. The saved become a pillar in the temple of God. They become a Merkabah with their own docking station back at base camp. They are free to materialize and dematerialize at will. Mountains of Words these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 22. 
Words and mountains in the Bible are related to each other in such a profound way that few know about it. We will now take a moment to go over some of the basics as this is a very important lesson. Once the correlations are understood, the student will have an extremely powerful tool for deciphering major portions of scripture. Are you ready? In the world of the esoteric, there is a concept called the male generative principle and a concept called the female generative principle. Using this Freemason logo as an example, the compass would represent the male generative principle, while the square would represent the female generative principle. Their union, or child, would be a combination of lines and arcs producing the symbol at the center. Note that the compass points upward, while the square points downward. A similar concept exists in scripture. Just as the compass points upward, so too do the mountains. And just as the square points downward, so too does the pit. Thus, a mountain in the Bible often represents the male generative principle or phallus. Conversely, pits in the Bible often represent the female generative principle or womb. Armed with this knowledge, we are now ready to decipher the meat of the word. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 22, Moses is referring to Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments that were given to him at the head of the mountain. Since we know that the seed is the word, we can see where this is going. Mount Sinai represents the male generative principle. God's seed is at the head or tip. Moses is playing the role of the Holy Ghost that helps with conception. He is like a tiny genetic engineer. Think of how Mary became pregnant. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on the Phallus mountain. The number 40 represents 40 weeks of pregnancy when it is just about time to give birth. As for the seed of God, that role is played by Abraham, whose name used to be Abram. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Genesis chapter 16 verse 2. The original plan that God had was for Abraham to place his seed into Sarah to bear fruit. Unfortunately, the couple decided to place the seed of the father into the Egyptian woman named Hagar. This event is echoed on Mount Sinai. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Galatians chapter 4 verse 24. For those looking to understand one of the most important lessons in the Bible, this is it. Hagar represents the Old Covenant. Sarah represents the New Covenant. Two covenants, two mothers. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, because she is in slavery with her children. Galatians chapter 4 verse 25, New International Version. Hagar's womb represents earthly Jerusalem and the womb of the earthly mother. Moreover, we see that Hagar represents the womb that bears children to bondage via the Mount Sinai phallus. The entire human race are her children. We are all trapped like prisoners here on this planet. We need a redeemer to pay the ransom money. Amen? But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26. Sarah's womb represents heavenly Jerusalem and the womb of the heavenly mother. Sarah is still a future promise. In other words, Sarah gives birth to the glorified body via Mount Zion. Yes, Mount Zion represents the male generative principle as well. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 32 verse 8. God's bride, the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai, played the harlot. They became impatient and disobeyed God's instructions. The molten calf represents Hather, the Egyptian woman. She symbolizes the womb of the earth mother, Hagar. She also represents earthly Jerusalem. Hagar gives birth to those in bondage. Thus, Moses cast the seed of God to mother earth. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf, and the dancing. And Moses's anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and break them beneath the mount. Exodus chapter 32 verse 19. 
Again, this is a picture of Abraham conceiving a child with Hagar. The child's name would become Ishmael. Moses must go back up the Phallus mountain once again. This time it is to portray the seed of Abraham that goes to Sarah. Peter adventure, this seed shall make an atonement for sin. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Exodus chapter 33 verse 1. Do you see the purpose of everything that has happened so far? The lesson of Mount Sinai is all about Abraham's seed. Interestingly, just as Abram's name was changed to Abraham, Mount Sinai seems to undergo a name change as well. It is also referred to as Mount Horeb. So, what happens to this second set of Ten Commandments? Does Moses cast them to Hagar Mother Earth again? On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. Exodus chapter 40 verse 2. No, Moses did not break the second set of Abraham's seed. Instead a special female egg cell was created so that Abraham's seed may fertilize it. This female egg cell is what scripture calls tabernacles and temples. We will learn more about this later in this presentation. Just know that this egg cell represents all of the women in the Bible, from Sarah to Mary, that carried the seed that was to become Jesus. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. Exodus chapter 40 verse 3. The tabernacle in the wilderness represented the ovum of Sarah. Thus, the seed of Abraham, that is to say, the two tables of the testimony, were placed in the nucleolus, the most holy place, of the ovum. This represents conception and thus, the fertilized tabernacle becomes a zygote. It is the zygote of baby Isaac, whose seed would ultimately lead to Jesus. Forty years in the wilderness is yet another representation of the forty weeks of pregnancy. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. This verse seems to echo what happened next. After the Israelites fled into the wilderness, a special timeline was created to track the progress of the genealogy of Jesus. Abraham's Ten Commandments seed was placed in the most holy nucleolus of Sarah's zygote. This bloodline continued for approximately 1,260 years to bring us close to, or exactly at, the birth of Jesus. Note that 1,260 days is 42 months and another pregnancy clue. Is this just a coincidence? Here is a timeline of temples that a historian created. Notice the date that Moses received instructions to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. It is just 10 years shy of the 1,260 years mentioned in the Revelation prophecy. From Isaac, to the lion of the tribe of Judah, Abraham's seed was nourished from the face of the serpent. Thou hast been in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13. The serpent was in the garden of Eden. He was covered with precious stones similar to the standard model we have been learning about. These same particles of matter can also represent nitrogen bases. We are being taught that the law not only represents the laws of the universe, but that the law also represents the genome written in the tables of the heart. Note that the serpent had many more nitrogen bases than our standard four of adenine, cytosine, thymine and guanine. We are being taught of a DNA construct that is superior to ours. Naturally, this serpent seed was on a mountain. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 14. The mountain of God was in the Garden of Eden. This mountain was another representation of the male generative principle. Somehow, the seed of the mountain became corrupted. See how the word of God remains consistent. Once again we see that a mountain represents a phallus. The seed flows from the head of the mountain phallus. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. Genesis chapter 2 verse 10. The single river head of the mountain phallus split into four rivers. These four rivers fertilized the garden. 
Get it? You know what fertilizer is now. In other words, four nitrogen bases of adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine float out of the mountain phallus as the four rivers. Now this might sound crazy until we realize that the fruits on the tree of life, as well as the tree of knowledge of good and evil, represented female egg cells. Indeed, we are looking at the process of ovum fertilization. It is as if Eden represented Jerusalem, and the Garden of Eden represented the tabernacle within it. More on this soon. And I looked, and, lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 14 verse 1. Mount Zion is another representation of God's seed emanating from a phallus. The male generative principle can be seen in this graphic image. The lamb represents the word of God as well as Abraham's seed standing on the tip. There are other seeds as well. These are the 144,000 that follow the lamb. This is because a male does not plant a single seed into the womb. There are many seeds that flow out of the phallus like a river or stream. Now you know what the word, first fruits, means. And it shall come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2. There are many euphemisms throughout the Bible. Once seen, they cannot be unseen. The nations will flow like semen into and out of the phallic mountain. But, where does this seed eventually flow? Is there a womb that will descend on top of it? Look closely at the verse. The seed eventually flows into the Lord's house. What is the Lord's house? New Jerusalem descends on top of the phallus. Do you see it now? Again, New Jerusalem represents the womb of Sarah, the mother of us all. She will join with Father Abraham and his seed one day. The two become one. The saved are born again. Like a strong man running a race, the bridegroom's son is ready to fertilize the tabernacle ovum. The heavens declare the glory of God. Hopefully, Abraham will take his libido pills and will not have any dysfunction when the time comes to put on strength. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 1. Sounds like the happy couple will have plenty of encouragement. And when it is time to consummate the marriage, the uncircumcised phallus will not be able to penetrate the gates of the bride. The lamb will lead the rest of the seed to living fountains of waters. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9. Another set of mountains in the Bible that represent the male generative principle are the seven mountains the harlot, sits, on, in other words procreates with, to conceive seven antichrists. This time, the mountain is the seed of the serpent. If one is a good student of the word, they will understand that earthly Jerusalem is linked to mystery Babylon. She represents the biological mother of the human race. It is all about where our corrupt genetics came from not some harlot church down the street or in Rome. Salvation is the message here. Do not hate your brothers and sisters because they go to a different church than you. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Revelation chapter 17 verse 10. The womb of the earth mother Hagar, earthly Jerusalem, played the harlot on top of every high hill and every green tree. This is meant to be interpreted literally. The act of procreation gave birth to these seven wicked individuals throughout history. Note that the seven phallus mountains are also the heads of the dragon that casts its semen out of its mouth at the ovum moon of Sarah. Stay tuned for more info. And of course, this lesson would not be complete without a mother of all phallic mountains. Brace yourselves for this one. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Genesis chapter 11 verse 4. Where to begin? There is much to unpack in this verse. Apparently the people of Babylon wanted to erect the world's biggest phallus, the infamous Tower of Babel. Just the tip was to reach into heaven. According to Wikipedia, phallic symbolism was prevalent in the architectural tradition of ancient Babylon. In this context, the city of Babel represents the female generative principle. 
The tower represents the male generative principle. Together, they are in union. Remember, Babylon is famous in the Bible for playing the harlot. There is something else Babylon is known for in scripture. Pay attention to the phrase, make us a name. This is an important clue. Earlier we learned that the names in the Book of Life are genetic sequences. Something similar is happening here. They wanted to make their name famous by making their own Book of Life. They wanted their names to be exalted above all others, perhaps even over God. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. Scholars associate the phrase, make us a name, with the phrase, men of renown, with regards to the giants. The genetic engineering that led to hybrid humans and other abominations is what caused God to create the flood in the first place. Altering the word of God leads to mutation and confusion. We are definitely seeing a pattern here. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Genesis chapter 11 verse 9. The word, Babel, comes from the word, Balal, which means confusion. Many churches today teach that mystery Babylon represents, false gospel, or, false religion. Not only can this lead to division and hate, it can lead to arrogant dogmas of, my denomination is better than yours. There is a deeper meaning here that everyone can agree upon. If the good seed is the pure uncorrupted word of God, then the bad seed is Babel and the corrupted word of God. Again, it is about genetics, not verse interpretation. It is about the kingdom of God seed bank. Babel represents a genome that is confused and mingled. In fact, Balal also means to mix or mingle seed. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Hosea chapter 7 verse 8. Mingling the word of God genetic code is truly a half-baked idea. As is the days of Noah, when the floods came to exterminate the genetic abominations of the time, so too will the end be. We are at the precipice. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Daniel chapter 2 verse 43. This may be the most important verse in the entire Bible when it comes to understanding what causes the end to transpire. Seed will be mingled, however it will not be done per the usual, cleaving, process of good old-fashioned biological procreation. The mingling will be done a different way through iron technology and a false Holy Ghost genetic engineer. They cursed the sacred tree. On the Atta seal, Enki is depicted with two streams of water flowing into each of his shoulders, one the Tigris, the other the Euphrates. Alongside him are two trees, symbolizing the male and female aspects of nature. He is shown wearing a flounced skirt and a cone-shaped hat. Wikipedia. Now is a good time to show something rather interesting that can be seen in ancient texts and images. This will be brief as there is too much to cover in this presentation. Enki is the Sumerian god of water. Two streams of water can be seen entering into his shoulders. These same two rivers are mentioned in Genesis as watering the garden in two trees. They are Tigris and Euphrates. Enki is known as the Lord of the Earth. He is also known as the Lord of Semen. He is said to fill the rivers with his seed, to turn it into fertilizer. Does any of this sound familiar? This fertilizing seed of Enki is also called the waters of his heart. In scripture, the heart of the earth is the most holy place of the nucleolus where seed is mingled in the process of ovum fertilization. Remember Abraham's bosom? Keep all of this in mind for later in this presentation. Enki then advises that they create a servant of the gods, humankind, out of clay and blood. Against Enki's wish, the gods decide to slay Kingu, and Enki finally consents to use Kingu's blood to make the first human. Wikipedia there are some who believe that Enki is Satan. This would fit well with what we are looking at. The seed of Satan is what fertilized the tree of knowledge of good and evil. As a result, we, slaves to the gods were created, imprisoned in our corrupt bodies. Sounds like we need the tree of life instead. Amen? Take a look at this particular seal. The strange looking object highlighted is called the tree of life. Is it really though, or are we being hoaxed by the trickster?
Upon closer inspection, it looks like egg cell fertilization. Are we looking at the seed of the serpent fertilizing an ovum? It sure looks that way. There is even a spirit hovering over the ovum as if it is getting ready to enter into it to be conceived. Speaking of which, how exactly did the sons of God enter into the daughters of men? Was it similar to how humans procreate or was there a different process involved? The fig sign is a mildly obscene gesture that uses a thumb wedged in between two fingers. Among early Christians, it was known as the manus obscena, or obscene hand, Wikipedia. Why would these beings place a fig curse on the so-called tree of life? What are the covering of fig leaves that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with? Was it a cursed genome? Even the most intricate details of the tree match perfectly with DNA. It is obvious that we are looking at some sort of genetic engineering being depicted here. This could have been a stylized reproduction of a technology that existed long ago and was passed down for generations. The more we study these seals, the more we see the chemical blueprints of life encoded right there under our noses the whole time. And yes, the powers that be know all this and are keeping this info hidden from you. Somehow the ancients knew about the atoms and periodic table as well. Where did they get their information from? Therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 7, New International Version. The floodwaters of the Euphrates that is being referenced in the verse is the king of Assyria as well as his army. Why is God teaching us that the Euphrates and floods of water represent people? Think of the giants and the flood of Noah. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. 2 Samuel chapter 22 verse 5. There we see it again. Will a flood of ungodly men return as in the days of Noah? Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Revelation chapter 9 verse 14. Because we now know that the four rivers of Eden represent nitrogen bases and seed, we can use that information to decode yet another very cryptic passage. The Euphrates is one of those rivers. Four angels are loosed from it. There seems to be an allusion to genetics here. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Revelation chapter 9 verse 15. These angels are connected with special time phrases. Hours are determined by the shadow of a sundial. Days are determined by the sun. Months are determined by the moon. Years are determined by the stars. Similar language can be found in Genesis. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. Let us not forget that the greater light represents the father, the lesser light represents the mother and the stars represent children. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold, and silver, and brass, and stone, and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Revelation chapter 9 verse 20. The four angels raise an army of 200 million cavalry who kill a third of mankind. Interestingly, the so-called army is called a plague in this verse. This is further proof that we are looking at symbolic language here. In other words, the four angels represent a genetic code that release a deadly disease in the last days. The Godhead Adam For thousands of years, man has tried various ways to explain the Godhead, or as some call it, the Holy Trinity. Some say that the Godhead cannot be explained, therefore any attempts to do so should be shunned. The Godhead should forever remain a mystery. So they say, those that do try to explain the Godhead, usually pick three completely unbiblical and arbitrary things to compare each component to. Examples include, past, present and future. And, solids, liquids and gases. How about light, heat and power? Maybe the Godhead is length, breadth and height? Once again, we turn to the word of God to explain. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. The answer to exactly what the ultimate meaning of the Godhead is, can be found in this verse. 
The problem is that most Christians simply cannot handle the truth it reveals. Various attempts have been made over the years by MostHolyPlace.com to open the eyes of Christians around the world in various forums on the web. Unsurprisingly, these attempts are met with overwhelming amounts of hatred, vitriol, name calling, false accusations, backstabbing, ad hominem, banning, and ultimately, complete and total censorship. In other words, typical behavior one might find nowadays from those that have the audacity to call themselves Christians. Sadly, these unrighteous acts of censorship are now beginning to be recompensed back to the Christian community and the world at large as freedom of speech is being taken away from everyone globally. The phrase, reap what you have sown, comes to mind. Please folks, if the information that is about to be revealed in this presentation, triggers, you, stop reading or watching, and do something else. Let the adults contemplate this revelation without persecution, otherwise we will all suffer the consequences. We are going to cut to the chase here and be blunt. Not only does Romans chapter 1 verse 20 provide an explanation as to what the ultimate meaning of the Godhead is, it also provides irrefutable scientific proof of the existence of God Almighty. How? By clearly demonstrating that the Godhead is what modern science calls atoms. In addition, the verse goes out of its way to state that mankind has no excuse for not knowing this. We are talking about encoded information describing the most intimate details of particle physics that has no business being in a book thousands of years old, yet there it is, for all the world to see. The SETI signal has been sent. Who can receive it? Because Romans chapter 1 verse 20 has so much information packed into a single verse, we are going to separate it into individual segments so that we may expand on each point. Detailed explanations as to how and why the Godhead represents the atom will be provided. For the invisible things of him. The invisible things of God are invisible not because they are too tiny for us to observe, but because they exist outside of our space-time continuum. Call it the spirit realm, where God dwells, the other side. It is all the same in the sense that we are not authorized to see it. However, just because we are not able to see the invisible things of God, that does not mean we cannot understand them. The Word of God provides us with many clues. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1. The Word of God existed before anything else, even before our universe was created. It existed before the three heavens were created. Simply put, God was, and is, a sentient form of information and power. This information energy eventually manifested itself into matter to form everything we see around us. Those that are familiar with the movie, The Matrix, may recall a similar concept in the form of a simulation. Much like an operating system or software program, the Word of God provides the necessary framework from which our entire reality is built upon. Literally. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. This verse proves we exist in a form of simulation, driven by computer code. Behind every particle of matter, there exists words. These words are God. It only took science a few thousand years to catch up to this profound understanding. This is a truth that many will simply never accept unfortunately. However, those that are able to receive this will be blessed with a superior understanding of the nature of our reality. From the creation of the world. We are at the moment just before the first verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Right at the beginning, the Word of God, software code, has begun to manifest into the interactive world we all exist in now. The invisible things of Him are finally able to be clearly seen for the first time. Are clearly seen. Now this may sound a bit contradictory. How can the invisible things of God be clearly seen? They are invisible, yet they are seen? How does that work? The answer is provided in the next part of the verse. Being understood by the things that are made. The invisible things of God are seen through the things that are made. In other words, through ordinary matter. From the particles that form atoms in the periodic garden of elements, to the states of matter that form the things we see all around us. We understand that there is something invisible behind them all called the Word of God. To put it another way, God is literally in all, and through all. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 6. 
This is another example of how important it is to take the Bible as literal as possible. We are now getting very close to what the ultimate meaning of the Godhead is. It exists in all matter. Even. The word, even, used in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, may be confusing to those that are not familiar with how the King James Bible interprets words. Even, should be understood as to mean, in other words, which is abbreviated as, i.e. His eternal power. The Word of God is always alive and powerful. God is an infinite field of unapproachable light and information. What would the Bible call that? For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. Light is energy. Light is information. Light is power. Sometimes this power can consume. God exists both inside and outside of our universe. This infinite information power source is something we will never be able to see or even approach. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 16. We have another witness to the invisible God. He is the power everlasting that created our universe. And Godhead. We are now back to the Godhead. And because we just finished an in-depth study of what the Godhead is, we now know that the Godhead has something to do with the ingredients ordinary matter is made from. But which one of these examples is it? Is the Godhead particles? Is the Godhead a chemical element? Is it states of matter? By process of elimination, we can discover which universal ingredient the Godhead ultimately represents. Our biggest clue is that the Godhead is a trinity. This means that the Godhead cannot be the twelve particles of matter. Since there are more than three states of matter, the Godhead cannot be that either. This leaves us with atoms. Could that be it? Could the Godhead be the same word we use for atoms today? Remember, science and the Bible must agree 100%. Atoms in general are made up of three components. The neutron, the proton, and the electron. Three parts. So far so good. But how can we be absolutely, 100% certain that the Godhead represents the atom? We will search the scriptures with all readiness of mind to see whether these things be true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. Since the Godhead is made up of the Father, Word and Holy Ghost, we know that the three components that make up an atom must somehow match. Continuing with our process of elimination method, we will look for clues to see which atomic component matches the Bible's description of the Godhead. We will start with the Holy Ghost. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Looks like we have our first match. Power, as we learned earlier, is the biblical word for electromagnetism and the electron. Let us find another witness, just to be sure. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 15 verse 13. There it is again, power, or electromagnetism, of the Holy Ghost. And, let us be honest here. The power of the Holy Spirit is one of the most popular Christian teachings out there. These connections are so obvious, it is practically common sense. Once again, a literal interpretation is the most revealing. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their Spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 20. The Spirit is the Holy Ghost. Where is the Spirit? In the wheels. In other words, the eyes are representative of the Holy Spirit and the electron. This matches perfectly with everything we have learned so far. What about the Word? What particle could that be? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1 verse 1. In scripture, the Word is Jesus. In chemistry the Word is the proton. How? The number of protons an element has, determines its type. For example, an element that has one word of God, or one proton, is hydrogen. An element that has two words of God, is helium. An element that has three words of God is lithium, and so on. This is why God teaches us to count the number of the beast. The number of the beast contains six words of God in it. It is the sixth element in the periodic table. It is the carbon atom. And so, by process of elimination, we are left with the father being representative of the neutron. 
This can be verified by one of the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16. This extraordinary verse is actually describing something in particle physics called beta minus decay. For you see, the neutron truly is a father particle in that it is the only particle that can give birth to, or begat, a son. The son can be transformed back into the father by something called beta plus decay. The only requirement is to receive power. I and my father are one. John chapter 10 verse 30. This verse describes perfectly that protons and neutrons form the single nucleus of an atom. They are two, yet they are one. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. 1 Corinthians 8-6. It does not get any clearer than that. It is as literal as can be. The Godhead, that is to say the atom, is what all things are made of. That includes us. Everything is made of the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. Period. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. By the Godhead, all things consist. This element in the room can no longer be hidden. Truth will prevail. So that they are without excuse. That pretty much sums up Romans chapter 1 verse 20. There is simply no excuse for not knowing this information. The throne nucleus. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. Revelation chapter 4 verse 3. We have seen much evidence that the Godhead is what science calls atoms. We will now double check this information with our Bible Rosetta Stone. The one who sits on the throne in this verse represents the Father. We see that the first gemstone the Father looks like is the jasper. This gemstone can be found at the lower right-hand corner of the high priest breastplate. When compared to the standard model, we find that the jasper corresponds to the tau particle. According to Wikipedia, the tau particle was named after the Greek word triton. This was an interesting choice as triton can mean several things. The official meaning from Wikipedia states that triton stands for the number 3, as in the third charged lepton to be discovered. Perhaps trinity would fit here as well. Triton is also a Greek god of the sea. As interesting as these correlations are, there is yet another meaning of the Tau symbol that is truly mind-blowing. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. Here we are, back in the book of Ezekiel and the man with the inkhorn, who could be a pre-incarnate Jesus. The phrase, set a mark, is in fact the Tau symbol. This is the same mark that is described as the seal of God on the foreheads of the saved. The Tau later became a symbol for life and resurrection. The fact that this symbol is used to describe God the Father simply cannot be shrugged off as mere coincidence. The second gemstone that God the Father is described as looking like, is the sardine stone, which is the same as the sardius. This is the very first gemstone on the high priest breastplate located in the upper left-hand corner. In the standard model, the sardine stone corresponds to the up particle. The third gemstone that God the Father is described as looking like is the emerald. The emerald corresponds to the down particle. Now, according to what the Bible is teaching us here, the Father, who represents the neutron in the atom, should be made up of up and down particles. What are the odds that these two particles would indeed be the ingredients the nucleus of an atom would be made of? The odds would be so astronomically high as to be impossible, yet there it is. Both neutrons and protons, found in the nucleus of a typical atom, are made of the sardius and the emerald. The up and down particles. This is proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God can be scientifically proven to exist. This incredible news should be making headlines around the world, yet sadly, most would rather God did not exist at all. And thus, only a small handful of people will ever get to see these revelations. Be thankful that God is showing this to you. Here is what the complete model looks like. The twelve gemstones represent the twelve particles of matter. The four tribe leaders of Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, and Dan are represented by the lion, man, ox, and eagle. 
These correspond to the four forces of nature. The Godhead, otherwise known as the Trinity, is representative of the generic construct of the atom. One particle that will be discussed in a future presentation is the Higgs boson. This particle is responsible for adding leaven, or mass, to the universe. The Higgs boson represents the sin that is carried by the high priest to make atonement for the Israelites. After comparing the throne room of the book of Revelation and Ezekiel's vision to the standard model of particle physics, we find that they align perfectly with one another. Theory of Everything A theory of everything is a hypothetical, singular, all-encompassing, coherent theoretical framework of physics that fully explains and links together all aspects of the universe. Finding a theory of everything is one of the major unsolved problems in physics. Wikipedia The more we study quantum mechanics and particle physics in the Bible, the closer we get to a theory of everything. Does the Bible hold the key to deciphering the greatest mysteries of science? It is certainly looking that way. We will now do a quick review of the basics to see how everything is put together, beginning with the three heavens. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth winking face. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12-2. In our, Genesis CAD, presentation, we show how the third heaven is completely missing from Christian teachings. The third heaven is the kingdom of God within. It is the microcosm of life that we are currently learning about. Sadly, without this vital piece of information, Christians are crippled in their understanding and therefore have great difficulty in piecing everything together into a simple, cohesive overall picture. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein and thou preservest them all. And the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6. In this incredibly revealing verse, we discover that God made all three of the heavens. What this implies is that God exists outside of them. In the beginning, nothing existed except the consuming fire of words. It was, and still is, God's ultimate form. It is where the Father, Son and Holy Ghost are combined together into an infinite field of pure information and energy. This brings us to the Baryon asymmetry problem. One of the greatest challenges in physics is to figure out what happened to the antimatter, or why we see an asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Matter and antimatter particles are always produced as a pair and, if they come in contact, annihilate one another, leaving behind pure energy. CERN. Here we have a fascinating clue. When matter and antimatter combine, it becomes a consuming fire, leaving behind pure energy. Does this sound familiar? Moreover, the world of science is baffled as to where all of the antimatter exists. We have the answer now. The consuming fire of God is where both matter and antimatter exist in a state of quantum superposition. Science calls this the cat state, as in Schrodinger's cat. Any attempt to breach this final veil and see the face of God will result in death. The state of the universe, as it is, does not violate the CPT symmetry, because the Big Bang could be considered as a double-sided event, both classically and quantum mechanically, consisting of a universe-anti-universe -universe pair. Wikipedia. Conversely, if antimatter universes do exist, they fall under the same laws of physics. The people there would die as well if they breach the veil of the consuming fire. Interestingly, it is theorized that time in an antimatter universe goes backward. And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 11. The word, backward, is associated with time going in the opposite direction from the way it does now. It is also associated with the unsaved. The unsaved are said to go, backward. Just like the sundial of Ahaz went backward. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward, and not forward. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 24. Do the unsaved go backward in time after being cast into the lake of fire? The evidence would suggest yes. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10. Just as we see the Godhead representing matter, 
Conversely, we see the anti godhead representing antimatter. The beast represents the anti neutron. The false prophet represents the anti word. The dragon represents the anti holy ghost. The anti trinitarians will be triple mad when they find out about this. We have more proof that science and scripture are at agreement. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Daniel chapter 7 verse 10. A fiery stream of antimatter manifests and proceeds from the throne of God. This is where the unsaved will be cast to go backward in time. They will also be consumed as matter and antimatter collide. The saved will experience the opposite. They are led to the river of life made of matter that also manifests and proceeds from the throne. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 22 verse 1. Now we know what the purpose of the throne is. It is not simply a chair that sits there. The throne is the main portal from which reality manifests from. This reality proceeds from the one. We will now put together what we have so far. Reality as we know it originates from God, the consuming fire of information and power who exists outside of the three heavens. The throne of God, however, is different. Similar to the sea of glass, the throne of God is the boundary between the consuming fire and the spirit realm. It is a portal from which reality manifests from. From the right hand of the throne proceeds matter. From the left hand of the throne proceeds antimatter. Something important to keep in mind is that reality manifests as a multi-stage process. Reality first begins from the word of God consuming fire. It travels through the throne of God portal and into the fourth dimensional spiritual realm of the wave function. Next, reality goes through the sea of glass portal. Once past the sea of glass portal, the wave function collapses into our three-dimensional world of the physical particle. We will now go over this process in more detail. Dimensional Hierarchy in the Bible In the beginning was the Word and the consuming fire. This is God in His highest form that the Bible seems to teach. It is the invisible God that no one except the Son can see. It is the Logos. The concept of a multiverse may fit somewhere in this area. It is where dimensions that are higher than the fourth dimensional spirit realm exist. It is the source code from which our universe, as well as the parallel universe of the new heavens and new earth, manifests. Scripture teaches that the worlds were framed by this word of God source code. Technically speaking, this would mean that our reality is a type of simulation, whether we like it or not. A disturbing notion in all of this is the possibility that we have no free will. Are we merely avatars experiencing a pre-recorded script, authored by God? This would add credence to theories such as pilot wave theory. Are we simply needles following a record groove? Is it possible to change the recording through prayer? Romans chapter 8 verse 9 teaches that the saved are controlled by the Spirit. How literal is that? In order for the software code to begin manifesting itself into our reality, there needs to be some sort of gateway or portal by which specific information can pass through on its journey to becoming waves, then particles of matter. This is what the purpose of the throne of God is for. These thrones can appear and disappear as infinite points of probability through which God can express himself. Each point has the potential of becoming waves of matter first, then eventually particles of matter, in an infinite series of parallel universes. These infinite points act as a sort of quantized flight path that God can travel through in his chariot or Merkabah. Each throne would therefore act as a boundary between the source code and the spirit realm. Once a piece of information has been singled out to be sent and manifested into a particular universe, said information then passes through the throne gateway and begins to manifest itself in a place called the heaven of heavens, the highest heaven, or the first heaven. This is the fourth dimensional spirit realm. If we use a modern scientific analogy, perhaps the wave function would best fit the description of this sacred space that exists between the world of the source code and the world of particles. It is up to you the student, to determine if these waves allow bi-directional free will communication, or whether they simply, pilot, and control the particles we exist in. The boundary between the 4D spirit realm of waves and the 3D physical world of particles is called the sea of glass and the terrible crystal firmament. This is the so-called door in heaven, 
that opened to allow John to pass through and be transported to the parallel universe of the new heavens and new earth. It is also the glass dome of Hebrew cosmology. The Bible teaches that we are merely shadows of the things that exist in the highest heaven. This is more evidence of pilot wave theory as a shadow cannot move on its own and has no free will. The second heaven is the macrocosm of Earth's atmosphere as well as outer space itself. The third heaven is the microcosm of the kingdom of God within. Ezekiel's vision is an example of the throne of God manifesting in the macrocosm. The throne room of Revelation, as we will soon see, is an example of the throne of God manifesting in the microcosm. Superman, Clark Kent and the Trinity Superman is a superhero who appears in American comic books published by DC Comics. In the franchise, Superman generally maintains two identities, Superman and Clark Kent. The Clark Kent identity is used whenever Superman wishes to remain anonymous. A recurring theme in the comic is that Superman and Clark Kent are never seen together at the same time. In this unusual scene from the movie Superman 3 however, we see a rare exception. A good Clark Kent can be seen emerging from within an evil Superman. They are two, yet they are one. A similar occurrence is happening between the father and the son in scripture, with the exception of the good versus evil part of course. In the spirit realm, the father and son are never seen together at the same time. Notice the operative words here. Father and son, not father and word. We do see however, the father and the word together at the same time. This is an absolutely crucial detail that makes all the difference in the world when it comes to understanding the Trinity. Whenever we see the Son in the spirit realm, he is always depicted in symbolic form, such as a slain lamb for example. That is because in the spirit realm, the Son exists as the Word of God. The Son is never in a human form. It is only when the Word of God manifests into our physical realm that the Son appears either in a human form, or parts of a human form, like a hand. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. This verse matches quite well with the vision Ezekiel saw. The Ancient of Days sits on his throne. The wheels of the chariot are underneath. The being who is sitting is the Father, the Word and Holy Ghost all merged and united as one. They exist in the heavenly realm above the sea of glass crystal firmament. As we learned earlier, the firmament is the barrier separating wave from particle. Anytime something breaches this barrier, it takes on physical, terrestrial aspects. I saw in the night visions, and, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. The Son of Man is Jesus in terrestrial human form being received unto the Father. They merge in the celestial to become one. Again, once the Son is on the other side of the barrier, he becomes symbolic extensions of the Father. And similar to the Superman 3 analogy, these symbolic extensions emanate from the one on the throne. Let us now read a familiar verse with this new understanding. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. Do you see it now? The throne being referenced here is the throne that the, one, in other words the Trinity, sits on. How can the Father and the Son be sitting on the same throne at the same time? You now know the answer. The Son is in the form of the slain Lamb. The slain Lamb represents the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus represents Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed represents DNA. DNA represents the Word of God. The Word of God in this context is a nucleobase with its seven electrons that is, sent forth, from the Father to all the earth. The Word of God springs forth from the Father like living waters flowing out of the belly of the Lamb. It comes from the inside. It comes from the heart. Let us review another witness. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation chapter 7 verse 17. Once again we see that the Lamb and the Father occupy the same space at the same time. The Holy Spirit is shared between them making it a trinity.
Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. John chapter 8 verse 42. This verse is another witness that Jesus emanates from within the Father. This is another example of how taking verses literally reveals much. We will soon study the word, kenosis, so that we may understand this special process. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John chapter 1 verse 18. Is this literal? Is the Son literally inside the bosom of the Father? All of the evidence suggests that the answer is yes. The three are one. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John chapter 7 verse 38. And there we have it. Like Clark Kent proceeding from the heart of Superman, the Lamb proceeds from the heart of the Father. The spirit waters proceed from the belly of the Lamb, filled with the living words of wisdom to nourish and feed. Indeed, the Lamb shall feed them. Now, there is an important question to go over. How does the Son of Man sit at the right hand of God? Right hand of God. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Luke chapter 22 verse 69. If there is only one throne that God sits on, how does the Son of Man sit on the right hand of it? Is there another throne beside it? To answer this question, we need to take a look at what is in, or on, the right hand of God. The more one studies the right hand of God, the more one will understand God's kingdom. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. We have our first clue. A book sits at the right hand of God. A book is another form of the word of God. As each seal of the book is opened, the Lamb begins the healing process to correct the genetic codes of the kingdom of God. This would suggest that the book with seven seals is in fact the book of life. The Lamb is taking ownership of the kingdom. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation chapter 21 verse 27. As each seal is opened, the genomes that are not written within are destroyed. Since it is the Lamb's book, only the Lamb has access. And since the lamb also represents a nitrogen base, we are looking at a marriage between RNA strands as well as a healing translation process. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 2. The heart of God is in his right hand. The tables of the heart are where the nuclear bases are written. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 10 verse 7. This verse has a double meaning. The hand is where to look for the kingdom of God. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. Where are the saved located? They are in the book of life, sitting in the right hand of God. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind? Job 12.10 how much more obvious can it be? The DNA codes of the soul are in the hand of God. Every form of life has a soul. It is the kingdom of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Acts chapter 7 verse 56. Heavens, opened, means that the sea of glass barrier is breached. The wave function collapses. The word of God takes on a human form again as the Son of Man who is often described as coming in the clouds of heaven. The Bible describes wave-particle duality all throughout its pages. Heaven and earth are witnesses to this duality. Heaven and earth as witnesses. Now that we have a deeper understanding of the vision of Ezekiel, as well as dimensional hierarchies and portals, we can begin to explore how the Godhead, as it relates to atomic particles, is depicted in the symbolism. As we learned earlier, a very important key to unlocking the mysteries of Ezekiel's vision is to understand that the terrible crystal firmament over the heads of the living creatures is the sea of glass. This acts as a barrier or dividing line that separates heaven above from the earth below. Thus, anything above the barrier is in the highest heaven. Anything below the barrier is in earth. It is like a dimensional portal that one might see in a science fiction movie for example. The barrier can be activated anywhere in our space-time continuum. 
That includes future and past. Above the barrier we find the throne of God, and its glory, therefore they exist in the heavenly or spirit realm. Conversely, the four living creatures and the wheels are below the barrier which tells us they exist in the earthly realm. What we are looking at here are two witnesses of heaven and earth. The Johannan comma helps us understand these two witnesses. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. In the heavenly realm of Ezekiel's vision, the Godhead, or Holy Trinity was there all along for those that had wisdom enough to see it. This is another New Testament revelation of an Old Testament prophecy. The being on the throne represents the Father, Word and Holy Ghost. They are three yet they are one. The fire, lightning, and glory represent the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits are also the glory and the rainbow. We know that the right hand of God is where we can find the Word. Let us take a closer look at Ezekiel. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and, lo, a roll of a book was therein. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 9. The Word of God manifested into the physical world as a hand that gave a roll of a book for Ezekiel to eat. Once again we see the spiritual lamb manifesting as the earthly son of man once the sea of glass barrier is breached. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and woe. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 10. The son of man is the only one authorized to open the book as we see in Revelation. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. And there we have it. The Lion of the tribe of Judah was there all along in the Old Testament. Remember, the book that Ezekiel ate caused his forehead to become like a six, six, six carbon diamond. This is a prophecy of the mark of the beast. Let us now look at how 1 John chapter 5 verse 8 describes the lower, earthly half of Ezekiel's vision. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. 1 John chapter 5 verse 8. This is where heaven and earth match up with each other. The wave and the particle are always connected. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. Clearly there is a link between the two witnesses. We will demonstrate this by connecting the heavenly spirit to the earthly spirit. Since we already know that the spirit was in the wheels, this part pretty much solves itself. Spirit matches with spirit. That takes care of the first part of the trinity. What about blood? Since the four creatures are described as living, it is safe to assume that they have blood in them, for the life is in the blood. Also, blood contains DNA. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. The four living creatures represent the blood and DNA of Jesus. They are the word made flesh. We now have a perfect match for the second part of the trinity. What about the water? Was there water in Ezekiel's vision? We could count the sea of glass as water. This would be the opposite of the abyss where the beast rises from. The sea of glass would be where heavenly beings are born out of. In scripture, waters can sometimes represent the amniotic fluid of the womb. Where else can we find water in the vision? And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 24. The voice of God is described as great waters coming from the wings of the four living creatures. This is another crucial piece of the puzzle that we will detail out a bit further. For now, just realize that the water matches with the Father. Remember, the Father speaks creation into existence via water. Heaven and earth are now two witnesses that are in agreement. Father matches with water. The word matches with the blood. The Holy Ghost matches with spirit. This is further proof that the entire vision was that of the Word made flesh. Body, soul spirit, the Holy Trinity. It is an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus, as the seed, that would enter the tabernacle of Mary's body to become God incarnate. We will now go over how water and the Father are related. Born of water. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John chapter 3 verse 5. This is a very controversial verse. 
What exactly does born of water mean? Without getting into too much detail, we will go over a few interpretations. Some suggest born of water is in reference to water baptism. This is a very popular opinion. Unfortunately, this makes baptism seem as if it is a type of work necessary for salvation, hence the controversy. The potential for abuse is a major concern. Also, this makes the virgin birth seem irrelevant. Born of water would be more meaningful if it were connected to the incarnation of Jesus going back to Mary. This brings us to another interpretation. Born of water may be referring to natural childbirth from the womb, which everyone has experienced. This fits well with the overall context of Nicodemus asking about re entering his mother's womb. It can be related to the incarnation and the Virgin Mary. Unfortunately, it is not a very inclusive interpretation as this was special and unique only to Jesus. There is yet another interpretation that is very inclusive. It is what we have been learning about in this presentation and involves all of us with regards to salvation. Moreover, said interpretation combines both the virgin birth and water baptism. Everyone wins. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Joel chapter 3 verse 18. The meat of the word is euphemism. This is the adult education that is almost never taught in churches. To those that have been paying attention thus far, this verse is yet another representation of the living waters that proceed from the phallus mountain. We will be bold and blunt in our interpretation. Just as the earthly father waters the earthly womb with earthly semen, the father in heaven waters the heavenly womb with heavenly semen. The Bible uses plants, rivers, trees, seeds, etc. to convey this message. Remember, Mary did not become pregnant with earthly semen. Mary became pregnant with the heavenly semen of the Father, in other words, from his waters. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. 1 John chapter 5 verse 6. Did Jesus come from a baptism or did Jesus come from the womb? When we add all of the evidence, we will see that it is in fact, both. Again, natural birth is closer to the meaning but fails in the sense that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, rather than earthly seed. If we utilize the meat of the word interpretation, what we end up with is much more profound and meaningful. Remember, the waters proceeding from the masculine throne of God are regenerative and supernatural. Those that partake never thirst again. The waters represent the creative force of God through his voice. What happened when Jesus was baptized? The voice of God uttered speech. Remember? And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. Do you see it now? The voice of God was a vital part of the born-again process. God's speech is related to the waters. Do not ignore this revelation. God's speech is synonymous with the waters. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 16. When God utters speech, he creates waters in the heavens that rain down as God's doctrine. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 2. Rain rejuvenates. Rain acts as fertilizer that makes life grow and flourish. Rain is God's speech falling on Mother Earth. You may have been told that this concept is a pagan teaching. Satan is keeping you from understanding the meat of the word. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Psalms 19-1 Just how do the heavens declare the glory of God? Are they uttering speech? Let us take a closer look at the word, handiwork. It is Strong's Hebrew 3027. The word is, Yod. In Isaiah chapter 57 verse 8, this word is translated as male genitals. In other words, the hand of God can represent the male generative principle. The phallus, the seed bank. The Book of Life Genomes. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. Psalms 19-2. Indeed, it is the rain that uttereth speech. It is the voice of God.
It is the handiwork of God's phallus, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiced as a strong man to run a race. Psalms 19 to 5. The son is also likened to God's seed. It is a bridegroom and a strong man running a race to fertilize the tabernacle ovum. Thy throne is established of old, thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Psalms 93, 2-4. The throne of God is compared to the voice of many waters. These, many waters, proceed from the phallic throne to fertilize the fruit on the feminine tree of life. But wait, where have we heard the phrase, many waters, before? And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Revelation chapter 17 verse 1. Yes indeed, we have an opposite here. Just as the many waters of the heavenly father represent heavenly semen, the many waters that mystery Babylon sits on represents the earthly semen of the earthly father. Mystery Babylon sits on the phallic mountain as an image of procreation. Said mountains emanate many waters of the human race she gave birth to. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Revelation chapter 17 verse 15. And now you get it. The waters that the harlot sat on represent the seminal fluid we all were conceived from. It is a flood of ungodly men. In other words, we are all born unto sin and need to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Thy mother is like a vine in thy blood, planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. Ezekiel chapter 19 verse 10. Once again, Jerusalem is symbolic of the womb of the mother. The vine in the blood is DNA. Fruitfulness is symbolic of childbearing. And just how does this woman bear fruit? In other words, how does the mother conceive children? She is conceived through the male seed of many waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Numbers chapter 24 verse 7. This verse speaks for itself. The many waters are the male seed. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 7. The waters in this verse represent the king of Assyria and his people. The king of Assyria is one of the seven antichrists the harlot gives birth to by sitting on the mountain phallus. Let us review one more verse. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat, and for wine, and for oil, and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 12. Mount Zion is the phallus. The nations like many waters of seminal fluid will flow together into it. The soul genome of the redeemed will be rejuvenated as a watered garden, born of water and spirit. A new song of genetic codes will be sung. In summary, earthly waters can be a euphemism for earthly seminal fluid while heavenly waters can be a euphemism for heavenly seminal fluid. Water baptism thus represents being born again from the latter. In the end, we all will have been born from both. We are sown a natural body, we are raised a spiritual body. The Four Spirits of Heaven Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, Son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 9 The general interpretation for the phrase, four winds, is that they each represent the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. However, there is more to the story here. God is once again giving us a revelation that the four winds had to do with bringing that which was once dead, back to life. In the valley of dry bones, the four winds are the special ingredient that puts flesh and blood back onto the skeletons. Since we now know that the Spirit of God is the breath that we breathe, and that breath is mostly nitrogen, we can see why there would be four winds. The four winds are once again, 
adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. The four winds are the word of God that quickens. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and, behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Daniel chapter 7 verse 2. Here we see another reference to the four winds. What do you suppose will happen next? Something coming to life perhaps? And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Daniel chapter 7 verse 3. Indeed, the four winds bring creatures to life. We are beginning to see why the four living creatures in Ezekiel's vision have the word, living, in their descriptions. The word of God is alive. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew chapter 24 verse 31. In this remarkable passage, we find that the souls of the saved are gathered from the four winds. And why wouldn't they be? Our souls are the letters that make up our DNA. God will send angels to gather our four wind nitrogenous bases so that our genetic codes may be saved and live forevermore. This leads us to the four horses of Zechariah. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 5. The four winds have another name. They are also known as the four spirits of heaven. Interestingly, the four spirits of heaven are described as being four horses. In addition, the four horse spirits share the same color descriptions as the four horses of the apocalypse in the book of Revelation. They are described as being white, red, black, grizzled, and bay. It is as if the wheels of God's chariot themselves act as the horses that make the chariot travel through space and time. It is important to note however, that the spirits are the horses themselves, and not the riders that sit upon them. The riders can be related to the four faces of the four living creatures, which represent the four forces of nature. And I saw, and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Revelation chapter 6 verse 2. The rider of the white horse had a bow, and a crown was given to it. The word associated with this writer is, conquer. Almost every instance of the word, conquer, in the Bible is translated as, overcome. The Bible associates the word overcome with strength. Thus, the rider of the white horse is a perfect representation of the strong force. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. The rider of the red horse was given a sword. The word associated with this rider is power. We have already provided plenty of verses proving that the word power in the Bible is the same as electromagnetism. See how easy this is. The sword can even be likened to the iron rod in which electromagnetism flows through. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Revelation chapter 6 verse 5. The rider of the black horse had a scale. The word associated with this rider is measure. This is another easy one. God chose the word, balance, to illustrate how gravity is used to determine a weight measurement between two items. Could God have made the concept of gravity any more obvious? Absolutely amazing. And I looked, and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Revelation chapter 6 verse 8. The rider of the pale horse was death. By process of elimination, we discover that death represents the weak force. The words associated with this rider are sickness, plague, and pestilence. This is another perfect fit with scripture. Weakness often leads to death. Note that hell followed with him. Hell is the shadow of death and follows just like any shadow would. It is almost as if hell is the fifth horseman. This would correspond to the nitrogenous base called uracil. When RNA becomes DNA, uracil is replaced by thymine. Thus, uracil is the shadow of thymine. Now that we have a good idea of how the four horsemen represent the four forces of nature, we should do a quick double check with Zechariah just to be sure. The chariot with black horses is going north, the chariot with white horses is going west, and the chariot with dappled gray horses is going south. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 6, New Living Translation. 
If we assume that this translation is accurate, we could deduce that the red horse is going east. When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, each tribe would camp in one of the four cardinal directions. The tribe of Dan, whose standard was the eagle, would camp on the north. The eagle represents gravity, we have our first match. The tribe of Ephraim, whose standard was the ox, would camp on the west. The ox represents the strong force, we have our second match. The tribe of Reuben, whose standard was the man, would camp on the south. The man represents the weak force, we have our third match. The tribe of Judah, whose standard was the lion, would camp on the east. The lion represents electromagnetism, we have our fourth and final match. And there we have it. The four horses of Zechariah and the four horses of Revelation are representative of the four forces of nature. Incredible. The more one seeks, the more one finds. What do you see? Something very interesting that we will be going over shortly has to do with the verse that comes after the pale horse. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. In a way, our shadowy fifth horseman, or hell, is associated with the fifth seal. The location that the souls are in is called, under the altar. We will soon find out that this location is part of Abraham's bosom where the saved rest. The opposite would be the bottomless pit, as in hell, where the unsaved are. We will now turn our focus to the throne room to decipher more of these clues. The throne room. After this I looked, and, behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. Now that we know Ezekiel's vision contained elements of interdimensional travel and portals in the space-time continuum, we can appreciate what is happening to John here in the book of Revelation. Instead of merely observing the throne of God and four living creatures from ground level, John was actually transported through the sea of glass firmament to the other side. John called it a door in heaven. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. The throne of God is often compared to the heart. This is where God is said to rule from. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15. If one were to look at the book of Revelation through the lens of human anatomy, something incredible happens. Not only do the verses match with precision, but they also reveal a great mystery. Let us go through some of these verses one by one to see if we can bring this mystery into the light. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Revelation chapter 4 verse 6. Just like we saw in Ezekiel's vision, there is a sea of glass and four beasts full of electron eyes. We will start with the sea of glass. Surrounding our hearts is something called pericardial fluid. This is a perfect representation of the sea of glass that acts as a barrier between worlds. This fluid barrier is like the fluid surrounding our brains and serves to cushion and protect the heart. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Revelation chapter 4 verse 4. Surrounding our hearts are 24 ribs. Naturally, there are 24 elders surrounding the throne. Ribs are white, which matches with the white raiment of the elders. Our ribs connect to the vertebrae in our spinal column. There are 33 vertebrae that lead to the head or crown via the spinal cord. 33 of course is a highly occultic number. Crowns also represent power. This power is cast through the spinal column to the brain. As the elders cast their crowns, they cast power. Hence the number 33 having to do with power and leadership. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. The seven spirits of God is the breath of life that breathes through the lungs. All the while my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Job 27-3. Air is mostly nitrogen, element 7. Thus, whenever we breathe, it is mostly nitrogen. God filled Adam's lungs with the seven spirits, 
and Adam became a living spirit with a soul. If we apply what we have learned earlier, that our souls are what we call our genetic code, we may conclude that the breath of God also filled Adam with DNA, and that this DNA came to life and was quickened. Thus, Adam became a living soul, a living genetic code. Notice that there were also lightnings and thunderings. Our hearts make a thundering noise whenever it beats. These thunderings are caused by the electricity or lightnings that power it. These are the four forces of nature we have been learning about, again represented by the four beasts. And I beheld, and, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. We already covered this verse earlier in this presentation. Seven represents nitrogen which in the context of the lamb, refers to the nitrogenous bases of the blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb is what pumps through the heart. It is the word of God. Paradise. When all the various descriptions of the throne room are pieced together using human anatomy as a guide, we find that we are in fact looking at a description of a chest cavity. And just like we learned in Ezekiel's vision, there are two witnesses being depicted at the same time. There is a heavenly witness, which is spirit, and there is an earthly witness, which is flesh. The heavenly throne represents the earthly heart. The four heavenly beasts represent the four forces of nature that power the heart. They also represent the heart's four chambers. The heavenly sea of glass represents the earthly pericardial fluid of the heart. The heavenly twenty-four elders represent our earthly ribs. The seven heavenly spirits represent the earthly air that we breathe through our lungs. And finally, the heavenly lamb represents our earthly blood and DNA that pumps through the heart. All of this is a picture of a chest cavity. But why? Why in the world is God describing a chest cavity in the book of Revelation? How about a hint? And it came to pass, that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and was buried. Luke chapter 16 verse 22. Do you see it now? A chest cavity is a bosom. Yes, this chest cavity is none other than Abraham's bosom. Meditate on the magnitude of this revelation. Has your church ever taught you this? Chances are they have not. This is the terrible consequence of censorship and false teachings. There are so many examples like this in the Bible that is hidden from the eyes of Christians. Why? Because contrary to what is often taught in the church today, Abraham's bosom is not only a real place, but still exists to this very day. It was not emptied out when Jesus died on the cross. This unfortunate lie has caused Christians to miss out on something truly remarkable here. The saved are still resting there, waiting for resurrection day. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Revelation chapter 5 verse 11. And there they are, the thousands upon thousands of angels surrounding the throne are in fact, the saved in Abraham's bosom. There they wait until all the seals of Revelation are opened, and all the trumpets are blasted. And now that we have reached this point in this presentation, it is time to learn about yet another body part that we have not yet covered. The altar. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. Revelation chapter 6 verse 9. Inside of Abraham's bosom is a place called the altar. More specifically, there is a place called, under the altar. This is a very special place. Let us just say for now that this is where the line starts to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These particular souls are anxious to see all of the seals opened, and the wicked destroyed, however they are told to, rest, a little longer. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 6 verse 11. Again, this verse is teaching us plainly that the angels in Abraham's bosom are, resting. They must remain there until the very last of the saved are killed as they were. This is proof positive that Abraham's bosom exists to this very day as these prophecies have yet to occur. Now then, in order to understand what under the altar means, we must first learn what this altar represents in human anatomy. Seed of Abraham 
As we promised, this next bit of information will be blunt and to the point. The altar represents Abraham's loins. Thus, under the altar is where the seed of Abraham are waiting. These are the saved. They are waiting to become born again. Not into a body of corruption, but into a body of incorruption. A glorified body is what awaits them. Similar to how reproduction occurs in life on earth, to become born again, Abraham's seed must enter the womb. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26. New Jerusalem is Abraham's wife Sarah. She is also a picture of a heavenly womb in which the saved will be born again from, and receive their glorified bodies. New Jerusalem is the ultimate, divine feminine. Did you know you had a new mother in heaven? Now you do. New Jerusalem is described as, cube, shaped. The odd shape may be a hint at a tesseract, which represents higher dimensions in the multiverse. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation chapter 7 verse 17. In order to become born again of Sarah's womb, Abraham's seed must be led from under the altar to Sarah's pearly gates. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation chapter 22 verse 14. Entering Sarah's gates is a picture of male seed entering the womb. Once inside Sarah's womb, the saved now have access to the tree of life. Does this sound too far out? Let us take a closer look at New Jerusalem to see if these things be true. New Jerusalem And first John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation chapter 21 verse 2 One of the biggest reasons for marriage is to have children. This is the key concept that must be understood here. The saved cannot become children of God until after the marriage ceremony. Only then can the saved become born again of a valid marriage. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Revelation chapter 21 verse 21. The gates represents the yoni and the entrance to the womb. Just as the throne room represents human anatomy, so too, New Jerusalem. There are twelve gates representing the twelve tribe genetic constructs. Once the saved, the seed of Abraham, enter the Yoni gates, they travel through the birth canal. Note that the word, canal, can mean a stream of water or river. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelation chapter 22 verse 1. We are now in the birth canal. The water of life proceeds out of the throne of God as part of the fertilization process. Think of the male seed entering the birth canal prior to conception. The seed must travel to the ovum tree of life to fertilize it. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation chapter 22 verse 2. In this extraordinary passage, the mystery of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden is given to us via its antithesis. The tree of life is the ovary that produces fruit on a monthly period. Each month a different fruit or ovum is produced. This fruit is fertilized by the living waters emanating from the throne room of Abraham's bosom. The saved partake of this fruit to be conceived into the glorified body. Mother of us all. When all the various descriptions of New Jerusalem are pieced together using human anatomy as a guide, we find that we are in fact looking at a description of the female reproductive system. And just like we learned in Ezekiel's vision, there are two witnesses being depicted at the same time. There is a heavenly witness, which is spirit, and there is an earthly witness, which is flesh. The heavenly fruit represents the earthly ovum. The heavenly tree of life represents the earthly ovary. The heavenly monthly fruit represents the earthly menstrual cycle or period. The heavenly pearly gates represent the earthly yoni or mouth of the womb. The heavenly river of life represents the earthly seed that fertilizes the tree. The heavenly pearls represent the earthly concept of conception as the spirit and soul enters the zygote. It represents a covenant. And there we have it. The mystery of New Jerusalem is now revealed for all to appreciate. Incredible, isn't it? Melchizedek, God's sperm.
Now that we can see the book of Revelation from a mature adult's point of view, we can finally appreciate what God has been trying to teach mankind for thousands of years. Not only is becoming born again literal, but the entire process is laid out for us, with the most intimate of details there for all to see. Everything boils down to a very specific genetic template that mankind must be upgraded with, or else be doomed to destruction. This is a pre approved template, meaning that mankind has no say in how it is designed. We must accept the code that God offers to us without alteration. There can be no modifications. This DNA template is first introduced to us in Genesis. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. One of the most mysterious, if not the most mysterious character in the Bible is a fellow named Melchizedek. Many Christians and scholars have tried to explain the meaning of this person over the years. Unfortunately, no one has solved this riddle, however, using our new understanding of Abraham's seed, we have a good chance at solving it now. How about we give it a shot? Our first clue is that, Melchizedek was a priest. This teaches us that it is the role of Melchizedek that is important, not necessarily the man himself, although some speculate that Melchizedek may not have been human. The reason is because of the most unusual way in which Melchizedek is described. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. This is the verse that sets Melchizedek apart from any being in creation. Meditate on those descriptions for a moment. No father or mother, no genealogy, no beginning or end, made like the Son of God. These descriptions sound as if this verse is describing God Almighty, however God Almighty had not been made flesh yet. Therefore, we must not jump to conclusions. We must focus on the context of the Melchizedek verses so that we may understand what God would like us to know about his priesthood. And he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis chapter 14 verse 19. This is a very important verse. Remember, the mystery of Melchizedek is revealed simply by staying in context. It is really that simple. Melchizedek is blessing Abraham because Abraham was to be an earthly representation of God's seed. This seed would later become known as Abraham's seed. Thus, immediately after Abraham's blessing, God appears, so that he may teach this important lesson to us. And, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Genesis chapter 15 verse 4. This is the context in which the blessing takes place. It is all about Abraham's seed. Notice the use of the word, bowels. This is the context that God will have his focus on. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. Notice that Abraham's seed is compared to stars. In the Bible, stars represent children as well as angels. This verse is hinting at the heavenly star seed that will produce the glorified body one day. To prove this, God sends his only begotten son, made after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, made in the template of God's seed. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 5 to 6. It is here that the mystery is fully revealed. When Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mary, God used the Melchizedek genetic template. To put it bluntly, Melchizedek represented God's sperm that impregnated Mary. Since this may be a difficult truth to receive, we will go over the supporting evidence. The body temple. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8. In the book of Exodus, God commands Moses to build a portable temple called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was to be made according to a very specific design. So specific in fact that the Bible actually records every detail of every piece of furniture, covering, support structures, etc. This is because God is teaching us something extremely profound here. Remember, tabernacles and temples in the Bible represent the human body. 
This is key to understanding what God is about to reveal to us. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. In this amazing verse, we learn that the tabernacle of Moses was in fact a three-dimensional, earthly representation of something that exists in the heavenly realm of higher dimensions. Earlier, we learned that a tesseract was a representation of higher dimensions. It is well understood that a four-dimensional tesseract casts a three-dimensional shadow. We also learned that the shape of New Jerusalem was most likely a representation of a tesseract. Therefore, if the tabernacle in the wilderness was a three-dimensional shadow of something in heaven, this shadow most likely would have been cast by the heavenly New Jerusalem. However, New Jerusalem is a city and not a temple. Where then could the shadow be coming from? And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Revelation chapter 21 verse 22. And now we have the answer. The Lord and the Lamb are the temple inside of New Jerusalem. They are the ones casting the shadow on earth. Therefore, the tabernacle in the wilderness was the earthly temple or body of Christ. Is this true? Of course. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn. This is because the temple represented his body, and the veil represented his flesh. Was this literal? Yes, however the question then becomes, just how literal? When we look at the tabernacle in the wilderness for example, we do not see an obvious shape of a body with a head, legs, arms, etc. We see a rectangular looking structure that bears little to no resemblance to a body whatsoever. This is because we are looking at the shadow of something inside of Sarah's womb. Remember? The temple is inside of Sarah's womb, where the tree of life ovary give new life to those born again. In other words, the tabernacle in the wilderness is a picture of an ovum at the moment of conception, inside Sarah. Biologists call this a zygote. Now, this may sound confusing since it was Mary that gave birth to Jesus. However, God appears to be teaching us that we are all, ultimately, the seed of Abraham. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29. In addition to being Abraham's seed, it is Sarah who is ultimately the mother of us all. But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Galatians chapter 4 verse 26. Abraham and Sarah are now one as prophesied. The two shall become one. Note that Abraham and Sarah can also be seen in Revelation 12 as the woman of the apocalypse clothed with the sun. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Revelation chapter 12 verse 1. Sarah is the woman. The moon represents the monthly ovum that Sarah has dominion over. The sun she is clothed with represents the seed of Abraham. What is important to understand here is that Sarah is not giving birth to a nine-month-old baby. She is a picture of the egg becoming fertilized. In other words, we are looking at the moment of conception. This brings us to the tabernacle ovum in the wilderness. The tabernacle ovum. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. John chapter 2 verses 20 to 21. Our lives begin as a single cell. Everything that we are, and ever will be, is contained in this tiny little tabernacle. This is what is meant by our bodies being the temple, and it all starts at the moment of conception, not nine months later as the pro-choice folks preach. Of course, Jesus was born of a virgin, therefore this process was a bit different. The male seed of Jesus was Melchizedek, the holy genetic DNA template of God, delivered via Holy Ghost. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. The way in which Mary, as a virgin, conceived Jesus is considered a great mystery. Why? Because the church is infamous for either hiding the truth from Christians or flat out lying. Thank God we do not have to rely on their deceptions for answers. 
The mystery of the virgin birth is revealed in the Word of God. Let us discover it together. Now that He ascended, what is it but that He also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9. What was that I heard you say? This verse is speaking of the death of Jesus, when He went to hell to release the prisoners in Abraham's bosom. As we have already mentioned, the church has made up a terrible lie regarding Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9. Was Abraham evil? Of course not. So why then would Abraham hold captives? Because it is a fairy tale. Do not fall for it. This verse is speaking of Jesus, descending from heaven, into the womb of Mary to be conceived. Thus, the, lower parts of the earth, is a parable for the womb. More specifically, the zygote. My substance was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Psalms 139-15 do you see it now? The wool that has been pulled over your eyes for thousands of years? The lowest parts of the earth, otherwise known as hell, is a parable for the womb and the zygote where Jesus descended into before being born. The modern church will never admit to what is plainly revealed for all to see. No, that would take power and control away from them. We know that will never happen. And so, the big lie of hell and infinite torments will continue, just as Satan wishes. Indeed, Abraham's bosom is alive and well. There are no, so-called, captives, being held there as if Abraham is some evil hostage-taker. Abraham's bosom is paradise in heaven, where the saved rest until the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, what happens in heaven is casting a shadow on earth. Let us now take a closer look at this process. We will be covering this in much more detail in a future study. For now, we will go over the basics. When one compares the tabernacle in the wilderness to a biological cell, something incredible happens. The two match up with such incredible precision, that it is impossible for this to be a mere coincidence. What this means is that the most intimate details of cell biology was encoded into the tabernacle structure, thousands of years before their discovery. Please note that the tabernacle in the wilderness did not depict just any ordinary cell. The tabernacle in the wilderness is a model of an ovum at the moment of conception, otherwise known as a zygote. This image shows what the tabernacle in the wilderness may have looked like, as well as its components or furniture. Each component has a corresponding organelle in the cell. The candlestick represents mitochondrial DNA. The table of showbread represents the Golgi apparatus. The Ark of the Covenant represents the nucleolus, and so on. We will now go over some of the basics. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 25 verse 22. The ark of the covenant represents the nucleolus of the cell. This is the command center. The mercy seat acts as a throne. Remember how the throne of God was made of sapphire in Ezekiel's vision. We learned that sapphire was the strange matter portal separating us from the spirit realm. The Ark of the Covenant is also a portal to the spirit realm where God communicates to the high priest. The Ark of the Covenant is also the heart of Abraham's bosom in the throne room, as well as the heart of the earth. Yes, you heard that correctly. The phrase, heart of the earth, is an allegory for the most holy place of the tabernacle zygote. The heart of the earth is where Jesus went after being crucified. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. The story of Jonah and the whale is a picture of what happens to those that are thrown into the lake of fire. It is a picture of conception within the zygote inside of the womb. Again, the zygote is the tabernacle. The tabernacle is our body temple at the moment of conception. The heart of the zygote is the nucleolus. This is where conception takes place, at the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus went to the heart of the earth, that is to say, he went to the most holy place of the temple to sprinkle his own blood. However, instead of becoming born again of corruptible flesh, Jesus was born again into the body of glory. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 14. As we learned earlier, Melchizedek, the high priest, represented the seed of God. 
The high priest enters the ovum on the Day of Atonement, into the heart of the earth, to fertilize the Ark of the Covenant. Notice that the seed of the Father is represented as blood in the Bible. It is sprinkled seven times to once again teach and remind us that we are looking at nitrogenous bases here. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. Now we know what Jesus was doing for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was sprinkling his blood in the most holy place of a more perfect and greater tabernacle not made with hands. Jesus was not suffering in the torments of hell. Neither was Jesus releasing prisoners from Abraham's bosom. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Genesis chapter 17 verse 16. Sarah represents the promise. And although Jesus came from the womb of Mary, his genealogy can be traced back to Abraham, Sarah, and the twelve tribes. More specifically, the tribe of Judah. This is why there is so much confusion and debate as to who the woman of the apocalypse is. Christians are not understanding the importance of this historical event. The student of scripture must go back to the very first verse of the New Testament, and all will be made clear. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. The New Testament begins by teaching us that, when it comes to the lineage of Jesus, we must use Abraham and Sarah as our reference point, not Mary. Therefore, the man-child that the woman on the moon gives birth to, not only represents Isaac, Jacob, David, Jesus, etc. but he also represents all the saved that will be grafted into the olive tree one day. In other words, the saved become Abraham's seed. Sons of God, daughters of men. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. Something that folks often wonder about is how in the world did the sons of God, the fallen angels, have offspring with the daughters of men. After all, angels in heaven have no reproductive organs. How do we know this? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Mark chapter 12 verse 25. If there is no marriage in heaven, then there is no sex, thus there is no creation of offspring. If that were the case, then we would have major contradictions with God's law regarding having sex and giving birth outside of marriage. Are angels having orgies in heaven since no one is married? Of course not. Moreover, if everyone is a son of God, in other words masculine, endowed with reproductive organs, what exactly are they supposed to do with said organs? Let us not go there. What about Adam and Eve? Did they have reproductive organs? In our tabernacle zygote study, we learn how Adam and Eve, before the fall, did not have reproductive organs. When Adam and his wife partook of the forbidden fruit zygote, they were clothed with a body tabernacle that gave them reproductive organs. That is what being born unto sin is all about. Note that this transformation occurred after they had fallen. That is the key to understanding. The angels that came into the daughters of men were fallen angels. Thus their biology was changed into something different than that of the angels in heaven. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 9 verse 1. The manner in which angels fall is given to us in this passage. They do not float down to earth as grown men, ready to have intercourse. They are falling stars. What is the biblical definition of a falling star? Do you know? What do stars falling to earth look like? Do you need a hint? Look closely at the image. What does it remind you of? Yes, falling stars in the Bible represent the male seed that is seeking to sow itself in the fertile earth of a woman's womb. In other words, falling stars represent a child that is about to be conceived. In order for this to happen, the angels must leave their first estate. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. Leaving their first estate can be interpreted as leaving their original angelic body. Yes, angels in heaven still have free will to leave if they so choose. Interestingly, these fallen angels have a type of immortal DNA called everlasting chains. 
Where did they get this DNA? And God looked upon the earth, and, behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Genesis chapter 6 verse 12. This is a genetic engineering verse. Something was happening to the DNA of all life on earth at that time. If it were not, then there would be no need for God to exterminate every living thing from the face of the planet. The flood was necessary in order for God to basically sterilize the land and start over with new seed that was stored in Noah's Ark. We now live in an age where we can understand the deeper meaning. Seed banks have been built all over the world just in case another event occurs in which the earth would have to be repopulated and reseeded again. This brings us back to the daughters of men. How were their fertile earth wombs seeded? That the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Genesis chapter 6 verse 2. In what way did the sons of God take wives? This is when it becomes extremely important to differentiate between earthly marriage and heavenly marriage. More specifically, between earthly conception and heavenly conception. Remember, after the sons of God left their heavenly bodies, they had to be reconceived all over again so that they could be birthed into a new body. In other words, they needed an earthly mother to place their essence into. This is called kenosis. We will go over what kenosis is soon. In order for kenosis to happen, they needed a mother and a wife all in the same person. Yes, their moms were also their wives. This is how it works when going from a heavenly body to an earthly body. By the way, this is an occult secret. One term that is used to describe this marriage to the world is hieros gamos. It is the method in which gods get married. It is also alchemical in nature. It is a mystical process that is often reenacted by pagan rituals and sex magic. In Egyptian mythology, Hathor is said to be both wife and mother of Horus. These concepts are not exclusive to scripture. Again, procreation and rebirth work differently when going from heaven to earth. Now, if this sounds too crazy, let us not forget that a similar process happened elsewhere in the Bible. Can you think of a story in which a son of God was conceived via a daughter of man without anyone having sex? But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Indeed, if Jesus can conceive himself without intercourse, then so can another son of God. Obviously the two events are juxtaposed to one another. Jesus is righteous while the sons of God who disobeyed were unrighteous. Jesus descended from heaven while the sons of God fell from heaven. Jesus came to salvage life. The sons of God came to corrupt life, etc. This is why Jesus is the only begotten. Jesus did it by the book. This makes Mary both wife and mother of Jesus. Does this sound blasphemous? Remember, Israel is often symbolized as God's wife. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city, and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 14. Mary is part of the lineage of women that carried Abraham's seed. And there is the key to understanding. The marriage is about conception. The husband is the male seed. The wife is the female seed. And since Jesus is his own father, in other words, since Jesus conceived himself, the metaphor is best understood through the lens of the kingdom of God within. Thus, just as New Jerusalem is both the womb of Sarah and the bride of the heavenly lamb, Similarly Mary's womb and ovum is the mother and bride to God's earthly seed. Indeed, this meat of the word concept is rarely taught. And they came unto the brook of Eshel, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates, and of the figs. Numbers chapter 13 verse 23. Do giants need to eat giant food? Apparently. Where do you suppose these giant grapes came from? And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Luke chapter 17 verse 26. Once again we see evidence of genetic tampering. Obviously, it was not just the animal kingdom that had been messed with. What comes around, goes around. And here we are all these years later making the same mistakes once again. And so, when we put all of the evidence together, we learn that the sons of God, as falling stars, entered into the most holy place ovum of the wives they chose. 
They sprinkled their own GMO abomination DNA in order to fertilize the ark and conceive themselves. Did they purposely tweak the recipe to make themselves extra large or was it a mistake? You decide. Kenosis. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 7, New Revised Standard Version. One term that scripture uses to define the conception of Jesus is, kenosis. The definition these verses use to describe this process is that Jesus, emptied himself. This is another way of saying, self-conception. Note that the verse states that Jesus, took on the form of a slave, or servant. And because Jesus created himself as a servant, he did not take advantage of this situation as the sons of God did. In other words, Jesus did not genetically engineer himself into a giant to exploit earth, its people and its resources. Satan is good at making counterfeits of what is holy. When Jesus genetically engineered a body for himself to incarnate into via the tabernacle zygote, he did it to fulfill prophecy and redeem mankind. This makes Jesus his own father. In other words, Jesus conceived himself through Mary. Remember how we learned that heavenly procreation is different? This is a strange concept we are not used to. The Tetragrammaton Now is the perfect time to discuss the name of God, aka, the Tetragrammaton. The name of God consists of four Hebrew letters that are read from right to left. On the right is the Yud. Next is the letter, He. Then the Vav, followed by another, He. This word is often translated as Lord, as well as God in the Bible. The meaning of this word is a topic of great debate. Currently, there is no consensus among scholars. No problem. Since we now possess the keys of understanding, we should be able to easily solve this riddle. Are you ready? The Yud is the smallest of all Hebrew letters. It has been likened to the atom that creates matter. A more accurate description is that the Yud represents the Word of God software code. DNA is also the Word of God. The letter, He, represents expression. According to scripture, the Word of God is expressed by a single strand of RNA. The meaning of the Vav is, that which connects things together. The Vav connects the two He strands of RNA to create DNA. When we put it all together, we have the ultimate meaning of the tetragrammaton. You should know the answer by now. That is correct. The ultimate meaning of the tetragrammaton is, the word made flesh. This is why, when Moses asked God what name he should give to the Israelites, God responded, I am, that I am. It was an Old Testament prophecy of Jesus, who was made flesh and did tabernacle among us. The Bible calls Jesus, the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and, behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. The Lord was in the infamous burning bush. It was here that God revealed the sacred name of the Tetragrammaton. This teaches us that the name of God has something to do with the burning bush. Thus, in order to gain more insight, we must learn more about this mysterious plant. And he put the candlestick in the tent of the congregation, over against the table, on the side of the tabernacle southward. Exodus chapter 40 verse 24. One of the things the burning bush can be related to, is the candlestick in the tabernacle. The candlestick has seven lamps of fire, representing the seven spirits of God. Naturally, since the number seven represents the nitrogenous basis of the word of God, the lamp itself is representative of the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Psalms 119-105. Interestingly, this verse belongs to a set of verses that go through the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew letter corresponding to Psalms 119-105 is the letter Nun. The letter is said to be representative of a serpent, as well as seed. Serpent seed. Jesus was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Something incredibly profound is being taught here. Both the burning bush and candlestick are representative of mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is passed down by the mother. This teaches us that the bush and candlestick are feminine symbols. They are the seed of the woman. Jesus would be the masculine seed mingled with it. Ultimately, these two feminine symbols represent the tree of life. Although Mary is not the tree of life, 
Some church paintings depict Mary as the burning bush with Jesus as the fire light emanating from it. The candlestick was even made with almond shaped bowls. Almonds are another feminine symbol, related to the vesica Pisces, Yoni, and Mandorla. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. Once again, we see that Jesus represents the Word of God nitrogenous bases, mingled within the seven lamps of the candlestick. Jesus is the Word made flesh that tabernacled with us. Conclusion There is still much to discover in the biblical text. We are only scratching the surface of how science and scripture are in complete agreement with one another. Thank you for taking the time to consider this information. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Please share this freely. God bless.